chapter forty six part two of supplements to the fourth book from the world as well and idea volume three by arthur schopenhauer translated by r b haldane and j kemp this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty six on the vanity and suffering of life part two accordingly if we regard man as a being whose existence is a punishment and an expiation we then view him in a right light the myth of the fall although probably like the whole of judaism borrowed from the zend avesta bundahish fifteen is the only point in the old testament to which i can ascribe metaphysical although only allegorical truth indeed it is this alone that reconciles me to the old testament our existence resembles nothing so much as the consequence of a false step and a guilty desire new testament christianity the ethical spirit of which is that of brahmanism and buddhism and is therefore very foreign to the otherwise optimistic spirit of the old testament has also very wisely linked itself on precisely to that myth indeed without this it would have found no point of connection with judaism at all if any one desires to measure the degree of guilt with which our existence is tainted then let him look at the suffering that is connected with it every great pain whether bodily or mental declares what we deserve for it could not come to us if we did not deserve it that christianity also regards our existence in this light is shown by a passage in luther's commentary on galatians chapter three which i only have beside me in latin sumus autem nos omnes corporibus et rebus subjecti diabolo et hospites sumus in mundo cuius ipse princeps et deus est ideo panis quem edimus potus quem bibimus vestis quibus utimur imo aer et totum quo vivimus in carne sub ipsius imperio est an outcry has been made about the melancholy and disconsolate nature of my philosophy yet it lies merely in the fact that instead of inventing a future hell as the equivalent of sin i show that where guilt lies in the world there is already something akin to hell but whoever is inclined to deny this can easily experience it and to this world to this scene of tormented and agonized beings who only continue to exist by devouring each other in which therefore every ravenous beast is the living grave of thousands of others and its self-maintenance is a chain of painful deaths and in which the capacity for feeling pain increases with knowledge and therefore reaches its highest degree in man a degree which is the higher the more intelligent the man is to this world it has been sought to apply the system of optimism and demonstrate to us that it is the best of all possible worlds the absurdity is glaring but an optimist bids me open my eyes and look at the world how beautiful it is in the sunshine with its mountains and valleys streams plants animals etc etc is the world then a rare show these things are certainly beautiful to look at but to be them is something quite different then comes a teleologist and praises to me the wise arrangement by virtue of which it is taken care that the planets do not run their heads together that land and sea do not get mixed into a pulp but are held so beautifully apart also that everything is neither rigid with continual frost nor roasted with heat in the same way that in consequence of the obliquity of the ecliptic there is no eternal spring in which nothing could attain to ripeness etc etc but this and all like it are mere conditiones sine quibus non if in general there is to be a world at all if its planets are to exist at least as long as the light of a distant fixed star requires to reach them and are not like lessing's sun to depart again immediately after birth then certainly it must not be so clumsily constructed that its very framework threatens to fall to pieces but if one goes on to the results of this applauded work considers the players who act upon the stage which is so durably constructed and now sees how with sensibility pain appears and increases in proportion as the sensibility develops to intelligence 
and then how keeping pace with this desire and suffering come out ever more strongly and increase till at last human life affords no other material than this for tragedies and comedies then whoever is honest will scarcely be disposed to set up hallelujahs david hume in his natural history of religion sections six seven eight and thirteen has also exposed mercilessly but with convincing truth the real though concealed source of these last he also explains clearly in the tenth and eleventh books of his dialogues on natural religion with very pertinent arguments which are yet of quite a different kind from mine the miserable nature of this world and the untenableness of all optimism in doing which he attacks this in its origin both works of hume's are as well worth reading as they are unknown at the present day in germany where on the other hand incredible pleasure is found patriotically in the most disgusting nonsense of home-bred boastful mediocrities who are proclaimed great men hamann however translated these dialogues kant went through the translation and late in life wished to induce hamann's son to publish them because the translation of plotner did not satisfy him see kant's biography by f w schubert pages eighty one and one sixty five from every page of david hume there is more to be learned than from the collected philosophical works of hegel herbart and schleiermacher together the founder of systematic optimism again is leibniz whose philosophical merit i have no intention of denying although i have never succeeded in thinking myself into the monadology pre-established harmony and identitas indiscernibilium his nouveau essay sur l'entendement are however merely an excerpt with a full yet weak criticism with a view to correction of locke's work which is justly of world-wide reputation he here opposes locke with just as little success as he opposes newton in the tentamen de motuum caelestium causis directed against the system of gravitation the critique of pure reason is specially directed against this leibniz wolfian philosophy and has a polemical nay a destructive relation to it just as it is related to locke and hume as a continuation and further construction that at the present day the professors of philosophy are on all sides engaged in setting leibniz with his juggling upon his legs again nay in glorifying him and on the other hand in depreciating and setting aside kant as much as possible has its sufficient reason in the primum vivere the critique of pure reason does not admit of one giving out judaistic mythology as philosophy nor of one speaking without ceremony of the soul as a given reality a well-known and well-accredited person without giving account of how one arrived at this conception and what justification one has for using it scientifically but primum vivere deinde philosophari down with kant vivat our leibniz to return then to leibniz i cannot ascribe to the theodice as a methodical and broad unfolding of optimism any other merit than this that it gave occasion later for the immortal candide of the great voltaire whereby certainly leibniz's often repeated and lame excuse for the evil of the world that the bad sometimes brings about the good received a confirmation which was unexpected by him even by the name of his hero voltaire indicates that it only requires sincerity to recognize the opposite of optimism really upon this scene of sin suffering and death optimism makes such an extraordinary figure that one would be forced to regard it as irony if one had not a sufficient explanation of its origin in the secret source of it insincere flattery with insulting confidence in its success which as was mentioned above is so delightfully disclosed by hume but indeed to the palpably sophistical proofs of leibniz that this is the best of all possible worlds we may seriously and honestly oppose the proof that it is the worst of all possible worlds for possible means not what one may construct in imagination but what can actually exist and continue now this world is so arranged as to be able to maintain itself with great difficulty but if it were a little worse it could no longer maintain itself consequently a worse world since it could not continue to exist is absolutely impossible 
thus this world itself is the worst of all possible worlds for not only if the planets were to run their heads together but even if any one of the actually appearing perturbations of their course instead of being gradually balanced by others continued to increase the world would soon reach its end astronomers know upon what accidental circumstances principally the irrational relation to each other of the periods of revolution this depends and have carefully calculated that it will always go on well consequently the world also can continue and go on we will hope that although newton was of an opposite opinion they have not miscalculated and consequently that the mechanical perpetual motion realized in such a planetary system will not also like the rest ultimately come to a standstill again under the firm crust of the planet dwell the powerful forces of nature which as soon as some accident affords them free play must necessarily destroy that crust with everything living upon it as has already taken place at least three times upon our planet and will probably take place oftener still the earthquake of lisbon the earthquake of haiti the destruction of pompeii are only small playful hints of what is possible a small alteration of the atmosphere which cannot even be chemically proved causes cholera yellow fever black death etc which carry off millions of men a somewhat greater alteration would extinguish all life a very moderate increase of heat would dry up all the rivers and springs the brutes have received just barely so much in the way of organs and powers as enables them to procure with the greatest exertion sustenance for their own lives and food for their offspring therefore if a brute loses a limb or even the full use of one it must generally perish even of the human race powerful as are the weapons it possesses in understanding and reason nine-tenths live in constant conflict with want always balancing themselves with difficulty and effort upon the brink of destruction thus throughout as for the continuance of the whole so also for that of each individual being the conditions are barely and scantily given but nothing over the individual life is a ceaseless battle for existence itself while at every step destruction threatens it just because this threat is so often fulfilled provision had to be made by means of the enormous excess of the germs that the destruction of the individuals should not involve that of the species for which alone nature really cares the world is therefore as bad as it possibly can be if it is to continue to be at all q e d the fossils of the entirely different kinds of animal species which formerly inhabited the planet afford us as a proof of our calculation the records of worlds the continuance of which was no longer possible and which consequently were somewhat worse than the worst of possible worlds optimism is at bottom the unmerited self-praise of the real originator of the world the will to live which views itself complacently in its works and accordingly it is not only a false but also a pernicious doctrine for it presents life to us as a desirable condition and the happiness of man as the end of it starting from this every one then believes that he has the most just claim to happiness and pleasure and if as is wont to happen these do not fall to his lot then he believes that he is wronged nay that he loses the end of his existence while it is far more correct to regard work privation misery and suffering crowned by death as the end of our life as brahmanism and buddhism and also genuine christianity do for it is these which lead to the denial of the will to live in the new testament the world is represented as a valley of tears life as a process of purifying or refining and the symbol of christianity is an instrument of torture therefore when leibniz shaftesbury bolingbrook and pope brought forward optimism the general offence which it gave depended principally upon the fact that optimism is irreconcilable with christianity as voltaire states and explains in the preface to his excellent poem le désastre du liban which is also expressly directed against optimism this great man whom i so gladly praise in opposition to the abuse of venal german ink slingers is placed decidedly higher than rousseau by the insight to which he attained in three respects and which proved the greater depth of his thinking one the recognition of the preponderating magnitude of the evil and misery of existence 
with which he is deeply penetrated two that of the strict necessity of the acts of will three that of the truth of locke's principle that what thinks may also be material while rousseau opposes all this with declamations in his profession de foi du vicaire savoyard a superficial protestant pastor's philosophy as he also in the same spirit attacks the beautiful poem of voltaire which has just been referred to with ill-founded shallow and logically false reasoning in the interests of optimism in his long letter to voltaire of eighteenth august seventeen fifty six which is devoted simply to this purpose indeed the fundamental characteristic in the proston pseudos of rousseau's whole philosophy is this that in the place of the christian doctrine of original sin and the original depravity of the human race he puts an original goodness and unlimited perfectibility of it which has only been led astray by civilization and its consequences and then founds upon this his optimism and humanism as in candide voltaire wages war in his facetious manner against optimism byron has also done so in his serious and tragic style in his immortal masterpiece cain on account of which he also has been honoured with the invectives of the obscurantist friedrich schlegel if now in conclusion to confirm my view i were to give what has been said by great men of all ages in this anti-optimistic spirit there would be no end to the quotations for almost every one of them has expressed in strong language his knowledge of the misery of this world thus not to confirm but merely to embellish this chapter a few quotations of this kind may be given at the end of it first of all let me mention here that the greeks far as they were from the christian and lofty asiatic conception of the world and although they decidedly stood at the point of view of the assertion of the will were yet deeply affected by the wretchedness of existence this is shown even by the invention of tragedy which belongs to them another proof of it is afforded us by the custom of the thracians which is first mentioned by herodotus though often referred to afterwards the custom of welcoming the newborn child with lamentations and recounting all the evils which now lie before it and on the other hand burying the dead with mirth and jesting because they are no longer exposed to so many and great sufferings in a beautiful poem preserved for us by plutarch de audien poet in fine this runs thus ton funta thrinein eis os erchetai kaka ton dao thananta kai panon pepaumenon kairantas euphimuntas ekpemtein domon that is lugere gentium tanta qui intrarit mala at morte sequis finiiset miserias hunc laude amicos atque laetitia exequi it is not to be attributed to historical relationship but to the moral identity of the matter that the mexicans welcome the newborn child with the words my child thou art born to endure therefore endure suffer and keep silence and following the same feeling swift as walter scott relates in his life of swift early adopted the custom of keeping his birthday not as a time of joy but of sadness and of reading on that day the passage of the bible in which job laments and curses the day on which it was said in the house of his father a man-child is born well known and too long for quotation is the passage in the apology of socrates in which plato makes this wisest of mortals say that death even if it deprives us of consciousness for ever would be a wonderful gain for a deep dreamless sleep every day is to be preferred even to the happiest life a saying of heraclitus runs to un bio anima men bios ergon de thanatos that is vitae nomen quidem est vita opus autem mors etymologicum magnum voce bios also eustathius ad iliad one thirty one 
the beautiful lines of the theogony are famous archin men mi psunai apikthani oisin aristan mid esidein augas oxeas ieliu funta dopos okista pulas aidao perisai kai kestai polin gin epamisamenon that is optima sors homini natum non esse nec unquam ad pexise diem flamiferumque jubar altera iam genitum demiti protinus orco et presum multa mergere corpus humo sophocles in oedipus colonus twelve twenty five has the following abbreviation of the same Mifunai tan apanta nika logon to depe fani binai kethen othen per ike polu deuteron os taxista that is natum non esse sortes vincit alias omnes proxima autem est ubiquis in lucem editus fuerit eodem redire unde venit quam ocissime euripides says pas dodumiras bias anthropon cuc esti panon anapausis that is omnis hominum vita est plena dolore nec datur laborum remissio and homer already said umen gar ti estin oidzu roteran andras panton osa de gaian epi penei tecai erpe that is non enim quidquam ali cubi es calimitosius homine omnium quot super terram spirantque et voventur two seventeen four forty six even pliny says qua propter hoc primum quisque in remediis animi sui habeat ex omnibus bonis quae homini natura tribuit nullum melius esse tempestiva morte natural history twenty eight two shakespeare puts the words in the mouth of the old king henry the fourth o heaven that one might read the book of fate and see the revolution of the time how chances mock and changes fill the cup of alteration with diverse liquors oh if this were seen the happiest youth viewing his progress through what perils past what crosses to ensue would shut the book and sit him down and die finally byron count o'er the joys thine hours have seen count o'er thy days from anguish free and know whatever thou hast been tis something better not to be balthazar gracian also brings the misery of our existence before our eyes in the darkest colours in the criticon parte one crisi five just at the beginning in crisi seven at the end where he explicitly represents life as a tragic farce yet no one has so thoroughly and exhaustively handled this subject as in our own day leopardi he is entirely filled and penetrated by it his theme is everywhere the mockery and wretchedness of this existence he presents it upon every page of his works yet in such a multiplicity of forms and applications with such wealth of imagery that he never wearies us but on the contrary is throughout entertaining and exciting end of chapter forty six recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty seven part one of supplements to the fourth book from the world as will and idea volume three by arthur schopenhauer translated by r b haldane and j kemp this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty seven on ethics part one here is the great gap which occurs in these supplements on account of the circumstance that i have already dealt with moral philosophy in the narrower sense in the two prize essays published under the title die grundprobleme der ethik an acquaintance with which is assumed as i have said in order to avoid useless repetition 
therefore there only remains for me here a small gleaning of isolated reflections which could not be discussed in that work the contents of which were in the main prescribed by the academies least of all those reflections which demand a higher point of view than that which is common to all and which i was there obliged to adhere to accordingly it will not surprise the reader to find these reflections here in a very fragmentary collection this collection again has been continued in the eighth and ninth chapters of the second volume of the Pererga. that moral investigations are incomparably more difficult than physical and in general than any others results from the fact that they are almost immediately concerned with the thing in itself namely with that manifestation of it in which directly discovered by the light of knowledge it reveals its nature as will physical truths on the other hand remain entirely in the province of the idea that is of the phenomenon and merely show how the lowest manifestations of the will present themselves in the idea in conformity to law further the consideration of the world from the physical side however far and successfully it may be pursued is in its results without any consolation for us on the moral side alone is consolation to be found for here the depths of our own inner nature disclose themselves to the consideration but my philosophy is the only one which confers upon ethics its complete and whole rights for only if the true nature of man is his own will and consequently he is in the strictest sense his own work are his deeds really entirely his and to be ascribed to him on the other hand whenever he has another origin or is the work of a being different from himself all his guilt falls back upon this origin or originator for operari sequitur esse to connect the force which produces the phenomenon of the world and consequently determines its nature with the morality of the disposition or character and thus to establish a moral order of the world as the foundation of the physical this has been since socrates the problem of philosophy theism solved it in a childish manner which could not satisfy mature humanity therefore pantheism opposed itself to it whenever it ventured to do so and showed that nature bears in itself the power by virtue of which it appears with this however ethics had necessarily to be given up spinoza indeed attempts here and there to preserve it by means of sophistry but for the most part gives it up altogether and with a boldness which excites astonishment and repugnance explains the distinction between right and wrong and in general between good and evil as merely conventional thus in itself empty after having met with unmerited neglect for more than a hundred years spinoza has in general become too much esteemed in this century through the reaction caused by the swing of the pendulum of opinion all pantheism must ultimately be overthrown by the inevitable demands of ethics and then by the evil and suffering of the world if the world is a theophany then all that man or even the brute does is equally divine and excellent nothing can be censurable and nothing more praiseworthy than the rest thus there is no ethics hence in consequence of the revived spinozism of our own day thus of pantheism the treatment of ethics has sunk so low and become so shallow that it has been made a mere instruction as to the proper life of a citizen and a member of a family in which the ultimate end of human existence is supposed to consist thus in methodical complete smug and comfortable philistinism pantheism indeed has only led to such shallow vulgarisms through the fact that by a shameful misuse of the a quovis ligno fit mercurius a common mind hegel has by the well-known means been falsely stamped as a great philosopher and a herd of his disciples at first suborned afterwards only stupid received his weighty words such outrages on the human mind do not remain unpunished the seed has sprouted in the same spirit it was then asserted that ethics should have for its material not the conduct of individuals but that of nations that this alone was a theme worthy of it nothing can be more perverse than this view which rests on the most vulgar realism 
for in every individual appears the whole undivided will to live the thing in itself and the microcosm is like the macrocosm the masses have no more content than each individual ethics is concerned not with actions and their results but with willing and willing itself takes place only in the individual not the fate of nations which exists only in the phenomenon but that of the individual is decided morally nations are really mere abstractions individuals alone actually exist thus then is pantheism related to ethics but the evil and misery of the world are not in accord even with theism hence it sought assistance from all kinds of evasions theodicies which yet were irretrievably overthrown by the arguments of hume and voltaire pantheism however is completely untenable in the presence of that bad side of the world only when the world is regarded entirely from without and from the physical side alone and nothing else is kept in view but the constant restorative order and the comparative imperishableness of the whole which is thereby introduced is it perhaps possible to explain it as a god yet always only symbolically but if one enters within thus considers also the subjective and moral side with its preponderance of want suffering and misery of dissension wickedness madness and perversity then one soon becomes conscious with horror that the last thing imaginable one has before one is a theophany i however have shown and especially in my work über den willen in der natur have proved that the force which works and acts in nature is identical with the will in us thereby the moral order of the world is brought into direct connection with the force which produces the phenomenon of the world for the phenomenon of the will must exactly correspond to its nature upon this depends the exposition of eternal justice given in sections sixty three and sixty four of the first volume and the world although subsisting by its own power receives throughout a moral tendency accordingly the problem which has been discussed from the time of socrates is now for the first time really solved and the demand of thinking reason directed to morality is satisfied yet i have never professed to propound a philosophy which leaves no questions unanswered in this sense philosophy is really impossible it would be the science of omniscience but as quadam prodire tenus sinon datur ultra there is a limit to which reflection can penetrate and can so far lighten the night of our existence although the horizon always remains dark my doctrine reaches this limit in the will to live which in its own manifestation asserts or denies itself to wish however to go beyond this is in my eyes like wishing to fly beyond the atmosphere we must stop there even although new problems arise out of those which have been solved besides this however we must refer to the fact that the validity of the principle of sufficient reason is limited to the phenomenon this was the theme of my first essay on that principle which was published as early as eighteen thirteen i now go on to supplement particular points and shall begin by supporting with two passages from classical poetry my explanation of weeping given in section sixty seven of the first volume that it springs from sympathy the object of which is one's own self at the end of the eighth book of the odyssey ulysses who in all his many sorrows is never represented as weeping bursts into tears when still unknown he hears his early heroic life and deeds sung by the bard demodocus in the palace of the phaeacian king for this remembrance of the brilliant period of his life contrasts with his present wretchedness thus not this itself directly but the objective consideration of it the picture of his present summoned up by his past calls forth his tears he feels sympathy with himself euripides makes the innocently condemned hippolytus bemoaning his own fate express the same feeling feu eith in emauton pros blephein enantian stant os edacrus oea pascomen caca that is heu si liceret mihi met ipsum extrinsecus spectare quanto pere de flerim mala quae patior 
finally as a proof of my explanation an anecdote may be given here which i take from the english journal the herald of the sixteenth july eighteen thirty six a client when he had heard his case set forth by his counsel in court burst into a flood of tears and cried i never knew i had suffered half so much till i heard it here to-day i have shown in section fifty five of the first volume how notwithstanding the unalterable nature of the character that is of the special fundamental will of a man a real moral repentance is yet possible i wish however to add the following explanation which i must preface by a few definitions inclination is every strong susceptibility of the will for motives of a certain kind passion is an inclination so strong that the motives which excite it exercise a power over the will which is stronger than that of every possible motive that can oppose them thus its mastery over the will becomes absolute and consequently with reference to it the will is passive or suffering it must however be remarked here that passions seldom reach the degree at which they fully answer to the definition but rather bear their name as mere approximations to it therefore there are then still counter motives which are able at least to restrict their effect if only they appear distinctly in consciousness the emotion is just as irresistible but yet only a passing excitement of the will by a motive which receives its power not from a deeply rooted inclination but merely from the fact that appearing suddenly it excludes for the moment the counter effect of all other motives for it consists of an idea which completely obscures all others by its excessive vividness or as it were conceals them entirely by its too close proximity so that they cannot enter consciousness and act on the will whereby therefore the capacity for reflection and with it intellectual freedom is to a certain extent abolished accordingly the emotion is related to the passion as delirium to madness moral repentance is now conditioned by the fact that before the act the inclination to it did not leave the intellect free scope because it did not allow it to contemplate clearly and fully the counter motives but rather turned it ever anew to the motives in its own favour but now after the act has been performed these motives are by this itself neutralised and consequently have become ineffective now reality brings before the intellect the counter motives as the consequences of the act which have already appeared and the intellect now knows that they would have been the stronger if it had only adequately contemplated and weighed them thus the man becomes conscious that he has done what was really not in accordance with his will this knowledge is repentance for he has not acted with full intellectual freedom for all the motives did not attain to efficiency what excluded the motives opposed to the action was in the case of the hasty action the emotion and in the case of the deliberate action the passion it has also often depended upon the circumstance that his reason certainly presented to him the counter motives in the abstract but was not supported by a sufficiently strong imagination to present to him their whole content and true significance in images examples of what has been said are the cases in which revenge jealousy or avarice have led to murder after it is committed they are extinguished and now justice sympathy the remembrance of former friendship raise their voices and say all that they would have said before if they had been allowed to speak then enters the bitter repentance which says if it were not done it would never happen an incomparable representation of this is afforded by the old scottish ballad which has also been translated by herder edward edward in an analogous manner the neglect of one's own good may occasion an egotistical repentance for example when an otherwise unadvisable marriage is concluded in consequence of passionate love which now is extinguished just by the marriage and for the first time the counter motives of personal interest lost independence etc etc come into consciousness and speak as they would have spoken before if they had been allowed utterance all such actions accordingly spring from a relative weakness of intellect because it lets itself be mastered by the will just where its function as the presenter of motives ought to have been inexorably fulfilled without allowing itself to be disturbed by the will the vehemence of the will is here only indirectly the cause 
in that it interferes with the intellect and thereby prepares for itself repentance the reasonableness of the character sophrosuni which is opposed to passionateness really consists in this that the will never overpowers the intellect to such an extent as to prevent it from correctly exercising its function of the distinct full and clear exposition of the motives in the abstract for the reason in the concrete for the imagination now this may just as well depend upon the moderation and mildness of the will as upon the strength of the intellect all that is required is that the latter should be relatively strong enough for the will that is present thus that the two should stand in a suitable relation to each other the following explanations have still to be added to the fundamental characteristics of the philosophy of law expounded in section sixty two of the first volume and also in my prize essay on the foundation of morals section seventeen those who with spinoza deny that there is a right apart from the state confound the means for enforcing the right with the right itself certainly the right is ensured protection only in the state but it itself exists independently of the state for by force it can only be suppressed never abolished accordingly the state is nothing more than an institution for protection which has become necessary through the manifold attacks to which man is exposed and which he would not be able to ward off alone but only in union with others so then the aims of the state are number one first of all outward protection which may just as well become needful against lifeless forces of nature or wild beasts as against men consequently against other nations although this case is the most frequent and important for the worst enemy of man is man homo homini lupus since in consequence of this aim nations always set up the principle in words if not with deeds that they wish to stand to each other in a purely defensive never in an aggressive relation they recognize the law of nations this is at bottom nothing but natural law in the only sphere of its practical activity that remains to it between nation and nation where it alone must reign because its stronger son positive law cannot assert itself since it requires a judge and an executive accordingly the law of nations consists of a certain degree of morality in the dealings of nations with each other the maintenance of which is a question of honour for mankind the bar at which cases based on this law are tried is that of public opinion two protection within thus protection of the members of a state against each other consequently security of private right by means of the maintenance of an honest state of things which consists in this that the concentrated forces of all protect each individual from which arises an appearance as if all were honest that is just thus as if no one wished to injure the others but as is always the way in human affairs the removal of one evil generally opens the way for a new one thus the granting of that double protection introduces the need of a third namely number three protection against the protector that is against him or those to whom the society has transferred the management of the protection thus the guarantee of public right this appears most completely attainable by dividing and separating from each other the threefold unity of the protective power thus the legislature the judicature and the executive so that each is managed by others and independently of the rest the great value indeed the fundamental idea of the monarchy appears to me to lie in the fact that because men remain men one must be placed so high and so much power wealth security and absolute inviolability given him that there remains nothing for him to desire to hope and to fear for himself whereby the egoism which dwells in him as in every one is annihilated as it were by neutralization and he is now able as if he were no longer a man to practise justice and to keep in view no longer his own but only the public good this is the source of the seemingly superhuman nature that everywhere accompanies royalty and distinguishes it so infinitely from the mere presidency therefore it must also be hereditary not elective partly in order that no one may see his equal in the king partly that the king himself may only be able to provide for his successors by caring for the welfare of the state which is absolutely one with that of his family if other ends besides that of protection here explained are ascribed to the state this may easily endanger the true end
end of chapter forty seven part one recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty seven part two of supplements to the fourth book from the world as will and idea volume three by arthur schopenhauer translated by r b haldane and j kemp this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty seven on ethics part two according to my explanation the right of property arises only through the expenditure of labour upon things this truth which has already often been expressed finds a noteworthy confirmation in the fact that it is asserted even in a practical regard in a declaration of the american ex-president quincy adams which is to be found in the quarterly review of eighteen forty number one thirty and also in french in the bibliothèque universelle de genève july eighteen forty number fifty five i will give it here in german the english of quarterly review Quote, there are moralists who have questioned the right of the europeans to intrude upon the possessions of the aboriginals in any case and under any limitations whatsoever but have they maturely considered the whole subject the indian right of possession itself stands with regard to the greatest part of the country upon a questionable foundation their cultivated fields their constructed habitations a space of ample sufficiency for their subsistence and whatever they had annexed of themselves by personal labour was undoubtedly by the laws of nature theirs but what is the right of a huntsman to the forest of a thousand miles over which he has accidentally ranged in quest of prey etc in the same way those who in our own day have seen occasion to combat communism with reasons for example the archbishop of paris in his pastoral of june eighteen fifty one have always brought forward the argument that property is the result of work as it were only embodied work this is further evidence that the right of property can only be established by the application of work to things for only in this respect does it find free recognition and make itself morally valid an entirely different kind of proof of the same truth is afforded by the moral fact that while the law punishes poaching just as severely as theft and in many countries more severely yet civil honour which is irrevocably lost by the latter is really not affected by the former but the poacher if he has been guilty of nothing else is certainly tainted with a fault but yet is not regarded like the thief as dishonourable and shunned by all for the principles of civil honour rest upon moral and not upon mere positive law but game is not an object upon which labour is bestowed and thus also is not an object of a morally valid possession the right to it is therefore entirely a positive one and is not morally recognized according to my view the principle ought to lie at the basis of criminal law that it is not really the man but only the deed which is punished in order that it may not recur the criminal is merely the subject in whom the deed is punished in order that the law in consequence of which the punishment is inflicted may retain its deterrent power this is the meaning of the expression he has forfeited to the law according to kant's explanation which amounts to a jus talionis it is not the deed but the man that is punished the penitentiary system also seeks not so much to punish the deed as the man in order to reform him it thereby sets aside the real aim of punishment determined from the deed in order to attain the very problematic end of reformation but it is always a doubtful thing to attempt to attain two different ends by one means how much more so if the two are in any sense opposite ends education is a benefit punishment ought to be an evil the penitentiary prison is supposed to accomplish both at once moreover however large a share untutored ignorance combined with outward distress may have in many crimes yet we dare not regard these as their principal cause for innumerable persons living in the same ignorance and under absolutely similar circumstances commit no crimes thus the substance of the matter falls back upon the personal moral character 
but this as i have shown in my prize essay on the freedom of the will is absolutely unalterable therefore moral reformation is really not possible but only determined from the deed through fear at the same time the correction of knowledge and the awakening of the desire to work can certainly be attained it will appear what effect this can produce besides this it appears to me from the aim of punishment set forth in the text that when possible the apparent severity of the punishment should exceed the actual but solitary confinement achieves the reverse its great severity has no witnesses and is by no means anticipated by any one who has not experienced it thus it does not deter it threatens him who is tempted to crime by want and misery with the opposite pole of human suffering ennui but as goethe rightly observes when real affliction is our lot then do we long for ennui the contemplation of it will deter him just as little as the sight of the palatial prisons which are built by honest men for rogues if however it is desired that these penitentiary prisons should be regarded as educational institutions then it is to be regretted that the entrance to them is only obtained by crimes instead of which it ought to have preceded them that punishment as beccaria has taught ought to bear a proper proportion to the crime does not depend upon the fact that it would be an expiation of it but rather on the fact that the pledge ought to be proportionate to the value of that for which it answers therefore every one is justified in demanding the pledge of the life of another as a guarantee for the security of his own life but not for the security of his property for which the freedom and so forth of another is sufficient pledge for the security of the life of the citizens capital punishment is therefore absolutely necessary those who wish to abolish it should be answered first remove murder from the world and then capital punishment ought to follow it ought also to be inflicted for the clear attempt to murder just as for murder itself for the law desires to punish the deed not to revenge its consequences in general the injury to be guarded against affords the right measure for the punishment which is to be threatened but it does not give the moral baseness of the forbidden action therefore the law may rightly impose the punishment of imprisonment for allowing a flower-pot to fall from a window or impose hard labour for smoking in the woods during the summer and yet permit it in the winter but to impose the punishment of death as in poland for shooting an ur ox is too much for the maintenance of the species of ur oxen may not be purchased with human life in determining the measure of the punishment along with the magnitude of the injury to be guarded against we have to consider the strength of the motives which impel to the forbidden action quite a different standard of punishment would be established if expiation retribution jus talionis were its true ground but the criminal code ought to be nothing but a register of counter motives for possible criminal actions therefore each of these motives must decidedly outweigh the motives which lead to these actions and indeed so much the more the greater the evil is which would arise from the action to be guarded against the stronger the temptation to it and the more difficult the conviction of the criminal always under the correct assumption that the will is not free but determinable by motives apart from this it could not be got at at all so much for the philosophy of law in my prize essay on the freedom of the will page fifty and following i have proved the originality and unalterableness of the inborn character from which the moral content of the course of life proceeds it is established as a fact but in order to understand problems in their full extent it is sometimes necessary to oppose opposites sharply to each other in this case then let one recall how incredibly great is the inborn difference between man and man in a moral and in an intellectual regard here nobleness and wisdom there wickedness and stupidity in one the goodness of the heart shines out of the eyes or the stamp of genius is enthroned in his countenance the base physiognomy of another is the impression of moral worthlessness and intellectual dullness imprinted by the hands of nature itself unmistakable and ineradicable he looks as if he must be ashamed of existence but to this outward appearance the inner being really corresponds we cannot possibly assume that such differences 
which transform the whole being of the man and which nothing can abolish which further in conflict with his circumstances determine his course of life could exist without guilt or merit on the part of those affected by them and be merely the work of chance even from this it is evident that the man must be in a certain sense his own work but now on the other hand we can show the source of these differences empirically in the nature of the parents and besides this the meeting and connection of these parents has clearly been the work of the most accidental circumstances by such considerations then we are forcibly directed to the distinction between the phenomenon and the true being of things which alone can contain the solution of that problem the thing in itself only reveals itself by means of the forms of the phenomenon therefore what proceeds from the thing in itself must yet appear in those forms thus also in the bonds of causality accordingly it will present itself to us here as a mysterious and incomprehensible guidance of things of which the external empirical connection would be the mere tool yet all that happens appears in this empirical connection introduced by causes thus necessarily and determined from without while its true ground lies in the inner nature of what thus manifests itself certainly we can here see the solution of the problem only from afar and when we reflect upon it we fall into an abyss of thought as hamlet very truly says thoughts beyond the reaches of our souls in my essay in the first volume of the Pererga on the appearance of intention in the fate of individuals i have set forth my thoughts upon this mysterious guidance of things a guidance which indeed can only be conceived symbolically in section fourteen of my prize essay on the foundation of morals there will be found an exposition of egoism as regards its nature and the following attempt to discover its root may be looked upon as supplementary to that paragraph nature itself contradicts itself directly according as it speaks from the individual or the universal from within or from without from the centre or the periphery it has its centre in every individual for each individual is the whole will to live therefore even if this individual is only an insect or a worm nature itself speaks out of it thus i alone am all in all in my maintenance everything is involved the rest may perish it is really nothing so speaks nature from the particular standpoint thus from the point of view of self-consciousness and upon this depends the egoism of every living thing on the other hand from the universal point of view which is that of the consciousness of other things that of objective knowledge which for the moment looks away from the individual with whom the knowledge is connected from without then from the periphery nature speaks thus the individual is nothing and less than nothing i destroy millions of individuals every day for sport and pastime i abandon their fate to the most capricious and wilful of my children chance who harasses them at pleasure i produce millions of new individuals every day without any diminution of my productive power just as little as the power of a mirror is exhausted by the number of reflections of the sun which it casts on the wall one after another the individual is nothing only he who knows how really to reconcile and eliminate this patent contradiction of nature has a true answer to the question as to the perishableness and imperishableness of his own self i believe i have given in the first four chapters of this fourth book of the supplements an adequate introduction to such knowledge what is said above may further be illustrated in the following manner every individual when he looks within recognizes in his nature which is his will the thing in itself therefore that which everywhere alone is real accordingly he conceives himself as the kernel and centre of the world and regards himself as of infinite importance if on the other hand he looks without then he is in the province of the idea the mere phenomenon where he sees himself as an individual among an infinite number of other individuals accordingly as something very insignificant nay vanishing altogether consequently every individual even the most insignificant every eye when regarded from within is all in all regarded from without on the other hand he is nothing or at least as good as nothing hence upon this depends the great difference between what each one necessarily is in his own eyes and what he is in the eyes of others 
consequently the egoism with which every one reproaches every one else in consequence of this egoism our fundamental error of all is this that with reference to each other we are reciprocally not i on the other hand to be just noble and benevolent is nothing else than to translate my metaphysics into actions to say that time and space are mere forms of our knowledge not conditions of things in themselves is the same as to say that the doctrine of metempsychosis thou shalt one day be born as him whom thou now injurest and in thy turn shall suffer like injury is identical with the formula of the brahmins which has frequently been mentioned taught tuam asi this thou art all true virtue proceeds from the immediate and intuitive knowledge of the metaphysical identity of all beings which i have frequently shown especially in section twenty two of my prize essay on the foundation of morals but just on this account it is not the result of a special pre-eminence of intellect on the contrary even the weakest intellect is sufficient to see through the principium individuationis which is what is required in this matter accordingly we may find the most excellent character even in the case of a very weak understanding and further the excitement of our sympathy is accompanied by no exertion of our intellect it rather appears that the requisite penetration of the principium individuationis would be present in every one if it were not that the will opposes this and by virtue of its immediate mysterious and despotic influence upon the intellect generally prevents it from arising so that ultimately all guilt falls back upon the will as indeed is in conformity with the fact the doctrine of metempsychosis touched on above deviates from the truth merely through the circumstance that it transfers to the future what already is now it makes my true inner nature exist in others only after my death while according to the truth it already lives in them now and death merely removes the illusion on account of which i am not aware of this just as an innumerable host of stars constantly shine above our heads but only become visible to us when the one sun near the earth has set from this point of view my individual existence however much like that sun it may outshine everything appears ultimately only as a hindrance which stands between me and the knowledge of the true extent of my being and because every individual in his knowledge is subject to this hindrance it is just individuation that keeps the will to live in error as to its own nature it is the maya of brahmanism death is a refutation of this error and abolishes it i believe that at the moment of death we become conscious that it is a mere illusion that has limited our existence to our person indeed empirical traces of this may be found in several states which are related to death by the abolition of the concentration of consciousness in the brain among which the magnetic sleep is the most prominent for in it if it reaches a high degree our existence shows itself through various symptoms beyond our persons and in other beings most strikingly by direct participation in the thoughts of another individual and ultimately even by the power of knowing the absent the distant and even the future thus by a kind of omnipresence upon this metaphysical identity of the will as the thing in itself in the infinite multiplicity of its phenomena three principal phenomena depend which may be included under the common name of sympathies number one sympathy proper which as i have shown is the basis of justice and benevolence caritas number two sexual love with capricious selection amour which is the life of the species that asserts its precedence over that of the individual number three magic to which animal magnetism and sympathetic cures also belong accordingly sympathy may be defined as the empirical appearance of the metaphysical identity of the will through the physical multiplicity of its phenomena whereby a connection shows itself which is entirely different from that brought about by means of the forms of the phenomenon which we comprehend under the principle of sufficient reason end of chapter forty seven recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty eight part one of supplements to the fourth book from the world as will and idea volume three by arthur schopenhauer 
translated by r b haldane and j kemp this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty eight on the doctrine of the denial of the will to live part one man has his existence and being either with his will that is his consent or without this in the latter case an existence so embittered by manifold and insupportable sufferings would be a flagrant injustice the ancients especially the stoics also the peripatetics and academics strove in vain to prove that virtue sufficed to make life happy experience cried out loudly against it what really lay at the foundation of the efforts of these philosophers although they were not distinctly conscious of it was the assumed justice of the thing whoever was without guilt ought to be free from suffering thus happy but the serious and profound solution of the problem lies in the christian doctrine that works do not justify accordingly a man even if he has practised all justice and benevolence consequently the agathon honestum is yet not as cicero imagines culpa omni carens but el delito mayor de hombre es haber nacido the greatest guilt of man is that he was born as calderon illuminated by christianity has expressed it with far profounder knowledge than these wise men therefore that man comes into the world already tainted with guilt can appear absurd only to him who regards him as just then having arisen out of nothing and as the work of another in consequence of this guilt then which must therefore have proceeded from his will man remains rightly exposed to physical and mental suffering even if he has practised all those virtues thus is not happy this follows from the eternal justice of which i have spoken in section sixty three of the first volume that however as st paul romans three twenty one augustine and luther teach works cannot justify inasmuch as we all are and remain essentially sinners ultimately rests upon the fact that because operari sequitur esse if we acted as we ought we would necessarily be as we ought but then we would require no salvation from our present condition which not only christianity but also brahmanism and buddhism under the name which is expressed in english by final emancipation present as the highest goal that is we would not need to become something quite different from nay the very opposite of what we are since however we are what we ought not to be we also necessarily do what we ought not to do therefore we need a complete transformation of our mind and nature that is the new birth as a result of which salvation appears although the guilt lies in action operari yet the root of the guilt lies in our essentia et existentia for out of these the operari necessarily proceeds as i have shown in the prize essay on the freedom of the will accordingly our one true sin is really original sin now the christian myth makes original sin first arise after man came into existence and for this purpose ascribes to him per impossibile a free will it does this however simply as myth the inmost kernel and spirit of christianity is identical with that of brahmanism and buddhism they all teach a great guilt of the human race through its existence itself only that christianity does not proceed directly and frankly like these more ancient religions thus does not make the guilt simply the result of existence itself but makes it arise through the act of the first human pair this was only possible under the fiction of a liberum arbitrium indifferentiae and only necessary on account of the jewish fundamental dogma in which that doctrine had here to be implanted because according to the truth the coming into existence of man himself is the act of his free will and accordingly one with the fall and therefore the original sin of which all other sins are the result appeared already with the essentia and existentia of man but the fundamental dogma of judaism did not admit of such an explanation thus augustine taught in his books de libero arbitrio that only as adam before the fall was man guiltless and possessed of a free will but for ever after is involved in the necessity of sin the law onamas in the biblical sense always demands that we shall change our doing 
while our being remains unchanged but because this is impossible paul says that no man is justified by the law only the new birth in jesus christ in consequence of the work of grace on account of which a new man arises and the old man is abolished that is a fundamental change of mind or conversion can transfer us from the state of sinfulness into that of freedom and salvation this is the christian myth with reference to ethics but certainly the jewish theism upon which it was grafted must have received wonderful additions to adapt itself to that myth in it the fable of the fall presented the only place for the graft of the old indian stem it is to be attributed just to that forcibly surmounted difficulty that the christian mysteries have received such an extraordinary appearance conflicting with the ordinary understanding which makes proselytizing more difficult and on account of which from incapacity to comprehend their profound meaning pelagianism or at the present day rationalism rises against them and seeks to explain them away but thereby reduces christianity to judaism but to speak without myth so long as our will is the same our world can be no other than it is it is true all wish to be delivered from the state of suffering and death they would like as it is expressed to attain to eternal blessedness to enter the kingdom of heaven only not upon their own feet they would like to be carried there by the course of nature that however is impossible therefore nature will never let us fall and become nothing but yet it can lead us nowhere but always again into nature yet how questionable a thing it is to exist as a part of nature every one experiences in his own life and death accordingly existence is certainly to be regarded as an erring to return from which is salvation it also bears this character throughout it is therefore conceived in this manner by the ancient samana religions and also although indirectly by real and original christianity even judaism itself contains at least in the fall this its redeeming feature the germ of such a view only greek paganism and islamism are entirely optimistic therefore in the former the opposite tendency had to find expression at least in tragedy but in islamism which is the worst as it is the most modern of all religions it appeared as sufism that very beautiful phenomenon which is completely of indian spirit and origin and has now continued for upwards of a thousand years nothing can in fact be given as the end of our existence but the knowledge that we had better not be this however is the most important of all truths which must therefore be expressed however great the contrast in which it stands with the european manner of thought of the present day on the other hand in the whole of non mohammedan asia it is the most universally recognized fundamental truth today as much as three thousand years ago if now we consider the will to live as a whole and objectively we have in accordance with what has been said to think of it as involved in an illusion to escape from which thus to deny its whole existing endeavour is what all religions denote by self-renunciation abnegatio sui ipsius for the true self is the will to live the moral virtues thus justice and benevolence since if they are pure they spring as i have shown from the fact that the will to live seeing through the principium individuationis recognizes itself in all its manifestations are accordingly primarily a sign a symptom that the self-manifesting will is no longer firmly held in that illusion but the disillusion already begins to take place so that one might metaphorically say it already flaps its wings to fly away from it conversely injustice wickedness cruelty are signs of the opposite thus of the deep entanglement in that illusion secondly however these virtues are a means of advancing self-renunciation and accordingly the denial of the will to live for true integrity inviolable justice this first and most important of cardinal virtues is so hard a task that whoever professes it unconditionally and from the bottom of his heart has to make sacrifices that soon deprive life of the sweetness which is demanded to make it enjoyable and thereby turn away the will from it thus lead to resignation 
yet just what makes integrity honourable is the sacrifices which it costs in trifles it is not admired its nature really consists in this that the just man does not throw upon others by craft or force the burdens and sorrows which life brings with it as the unjust man does but bears himself what falls to his lot and thus he has to bear the full burden of the evil imposed upon human life undiminished justice thereby becomes a means of advancing the denial of the will to live for want and suffering those true conditions of human life are its consequence and these lead to resignation still more quickly does the virtue of benevolence caritas which goes further lead to the same result for on account of it one takes over even the sufferings which originally fell to the lot of others therefore appropriates to oneself a larger share of these than in the course of things would come to the particular individual he who is inspired with this virtue has recognized his own being in all others and thereby he identifies his own lot with that of humanity in general but this is a hard lot that of care suffering and death whoever then by renouncing every accidental advantage desires for himself no other lot than that of humanity in general cannot desire even this long the clinging to life and its pleasures must now soon yield and give place to a universal renunciation consequently the denial of the will will take place since now in accordance with this poverty privation and special sufferings of many kinds are introduced simply by the perfect exercise of the moral virtues asceticism in the narrowest sense thus the surrender of all possessions the intentional seeking out of what is disagreeable and repulsive self-mortification fasts the hair shirt and the scourge all this is rejected by many and perhaps rightly as superfluous justice itself is the hair shirt that constantly harasses its owner and the charity that gives away what is needed provides constant fasts just on this account buddhism is free from all strict and excessive asceticism which plays a large part in brahmanism thus from intentional self-mortification it rests satisfied with the celibacy voluntary poverty humility and obedience of the monks with abstention from animal food as also from all worldliness since further the goal to which the moral virtues lead is that which is here pointed out the vedanta philosophy rightly says that after the entrance of true knowledge with entire resignation in its train thus the new birth then the morality or immorality of the past life is a matter of indifference and uses here also the saying so often quoted by the brahmins finditur nodus cordis dissolvuntur omnes dubitationes eusque opera evanescunt viso supremo illo sankara sloka thirty two now however objectionable this view may be to many to whom a reward in heaven or a punishment in hell is a much more satisfactory explanation of the ethical significance of human action just as the good vindishman rejects that doctrine while he expounds it yet whoever is able to go to the bottom of the matter will find that in the end it agrees with that christian doctrine especially urged by luther that it is not works but only the faith which enters through the work of grace that saves us and that therefore we can never be justified by our deeds but can only obtain the forgiveness of our sins through the merits of the mediator it is indeed easy to see that without such assumptions christianity would have to teach infinite punishment for all and brahmanism endless rebirths for all thus no salvation would be reached by either the sinful works and their consequences must be annulled and annihilated whether by extraneous pardon or by the entrance of a better knowledge otherwise the world could hope for no salvation afterwards however they become a matter of indifference this is also the metanoia kai aphesis amartion the announcement of which the risen christ exclusively imposes upon his apostles as the sum of their mission luke twenty four forty seven the moral virtues are really not the ultimate end but only a step towards it this step is signified in the christian myth by the eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil with which moral responsibility enters together with original sin the latter itself is in truth the assertion of the will to live 
the denial of the will to live in consequence of the appearance of a better knowledge is on the other hand salvation between these two then lies the sphere of morality it accompanies man as a light upon his path from the assertion to the denial of the will or mythically from original sin to salvation through faith in the mediation of the incarnate god avatar or according to the teaching of the vedas through all rebirths which are the consequence of the works in each case until right knowledge appears and with it salvation final emancipation moksha that is reunion with brahma the buddhists however with perfect honesty only indicate the matter negatively by nirvana which is the negation of this world or of sansara if nirvana is defined as nothing this only means that the sansara contains no single element which could assist the definition or construction of nirvana just on this account the jainas who differ from the buddhists only in name call the brahmans who believe in the vedas sabda brahmans a nickname which is meant to signify that they believe upon hearsay what cannot be known or proved asiatic researches volume six page four seventy four when certain ancient philosophers such as orpheus the pythagoreans and plato for example in the phaedo pages one fifty one one eighty three and following and see clement of alexandria three page four hundred and following just like the apostle paul lament the union of soul and body and desire to be freed from it we understand the real and true meaning of this complaint since we have recognized in the second book that the body is the will itself objectively perceived as a phenomenon in space in the hour of death it is decided whether the man returns into the womb of nature or belongs no more to nature at all but blank for this opposite we lack image conception and word just because these are all taken from the objectification of the will therefore belong to this and consequently can in no way express the absolute opposite of it which accordingly remains for us a mere negation however the death of the individual is in each case the unweariedly repeated question of nature to the will to live hast thou enough wilt thou escape from me in order that it may occur often enough the individual life is so short in this spirit are conceived the ceremonies prayers and exhortations of the brahmins at the time of death as we find them preserved in the upanishad in several places and so also are the christian provisions for the suitable employment of the hour of death by means of exhortation confession communion and extreme unction hence also the christian prayers for deliverance from sudden death that at the present day it is just this that many desire only proves that they no longer stand at the christian point of view which is that of the denial of the will to live but at that of its assertion which is the heathen point of view but he will fear least to become nothing in death who has recognized that he is already nothing now and who consequently no longer takes any share in his individual phenomenon because in him knowledge has as it were burnt up and consumed the will so that no will thus no desire for individual existence remains in him any more individuality inheres indeed primarily in the intellect and the intellect reflecting the phenomenon belongs to the phenomenon which has the principium individuationis as its form but it inheres also in the will inasmuch as the character is individual yet the character itself is abolished in the denial of the will thus individuality inheres in the will only in its assertion not in its denial even the holiness which is connected with every purely moral action depends upon the fact that such an action ultimately springs from the immediate knowledge of the numerical identity of the inner nature of all living things but this identity only really exists in the condition of the denial of the will nirvana for the assertion of the will sansara has for its form the phenomenal appearance of it in multiplicity assertion of the will to live the phenomenal world the diversity of all beings individuality egoism hatred wickedness all spring from one root and so also on the other hand do the world as thing in itself the identity of all beings justice benevolence the denial of the will to live if now as i have sufficiently proved even the moral virtues spring from the consciousness of that identity of all beings 
but this lies not in the phenomenon but only in the thing in itself in the root of all beings the moral action is a momentary passing through the point the permanent return to which is the denial of the will to live it follows as a deduction from what has been said that we have no ground to assume that there are more perfect intelligences than that of human beings for we see that even this degree of intelligence is sufficient to impart to the will that knowledge in consequence of which it denies and abolishes itself upon which the individuality and consequently the intelligence which is merely a tool of individual and therefore animal nature perish this will appear to us less open to objection if we consider that we cannot conceive even the most perfect intelligences possible which for this end we may experimentally assume existing through an endless time which would be much too poor to afford them constantly new objects worthy of them because the nature of all things is at bottom one all knowledge of them is necessarily tautological if now this nature once becomes comprehended as by those most perfect intelligences it soon would be comprehended what would then remain but the wearisomeness of mere repetition through an infinite time thus from this side also we are pointed to the fact that the end of all intelligence can only be reaction upon the will since however all willing is an error it remains the last work of intelligence to abolish the willing whose ends it had hitherto served accordingly even the most perfect intelligence possible can only be a transition step to that to which no knowledge can ever extend indeed such an intelligence can in the nature of things only assume the position of the moment of the attainment of perfect insight End of chapter 48, part 1. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 48, part 2. Of Supplements to the Fourth Book. From the World as Will and Idea, volume 3, by Arthur Schopenhauer. Translated by R. B. Haldane and J. Kemp. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty eight on the doctrine of the denial of the will to live part two in agreement with all these considerations and also with what is proved in the second book as to the origin of knowledge in the will the assertion of which it reflects in fulfilling the sole function of knowledge that of being serviceable to the ends of the will while true salvation lies in its denial we see all religions at their highest point pass over into mysticism and mysteries that is into darkness and veiled obscurity which for knowledge signify merely an empty spot the point where knowledge necessarily ceases therefore for thought this can only be expressed by negations but for sense perception it is indicated by symbolical signs in temples by dim light and silence in brahmanism indeed by the required suspension of all thought and perception for the sake of sinking oneself profoundly in the grounds of one's own being mentally pronouncing the mysterious om mysticism in the widest sense is every guidance to the immediate consciousness of that to which neither perception nor conception thus in general no knowledge extends the mystic is thus opposed to the philosopher by the fact that he begins from within while the philosopher begins from without the mystic starts from his inner positive individual experience in which he finds himself to be the eternal and only being etc but nothing of this is communicable except the assertions which one has to accept upon his word consequently he cannot convince the philosopher on the other hand starts from what is common to all from the objective phenomenon which lies before all and from the facts of consciousness as they are present in all his method is therefore reflection upon all this and combination of the data given in it accordingly he can convince he ought therefore to beware of falling into the way of the mystics and for example by the assertion of intellectual intuitions or pretended immediate apprehensions of the reason to seek to make a vain show of positive knowledge of that which is forever inaccessible to all knowledge 
or at the most can be indicated by means of a negation the value and worth of philosophy lies in the fact that it rejects all assumptions which cannot be established and takes as its data only what can be certainly proved in the world given in external perception in the forms of apprehension of this world which are constitutive of our intellect and in the consciousness of one's own self which is common to all therefore it must remain cosmology and cannot become theology its theme must limit itself to the world to express in all aspects what this is what it is in its inmost nature is all that it can honestly achieve now it answers to this that my system when it reaches its highest point assumes a negative character thus ends with a negation it can here speak only of what is denied given up but what is thereby won what is laid hold of it is obliged at the conclusion of the fourth book to denote as nothing and can only add the consolation that it is merely a relative not an absolute nothing for if something is none of all the things which we know it is certainly for us speaking generally nothing but it does not yet follow from this that it is absolutely nothing that from every possible point of view and in every possible sense it must be nothing but only that we are limited to a completely negative knowledge of it which may very well lie in the limitation of our point of view now it is just here that the mystic proceeds positively and therefore it is just from this point that nothing but mysticism remains however any one who wishes this kind of supplement to the negative knowledge to which alone philosophy can guide him will find it in its most beautiful and richest form in the upnekhat and also in the aeneids of plotinus in scotus erigena in passages of jacob boom but especially in the marvellous work of madame de guillon le torrent and in angelus silesius finally also in the poems of the sufis of which toluk has given us a collection translated into latin and another translated into german and in many other works the sufis are the gnostics of islam hence sadi denotes them by a word which may be translated full of insight theism calculated with reference to the capacity of the multitude places the source of existence without us as an object all mysticism and so also sufism according to the various degrees of its initiation draws it gradually back within us as the subject and the adept recognizes at last with wonder and delight that he is it himself this procedure common to all mysticism we find not only expressed by meister eckhart the father of german mysticism in the form of a precept for the perfect ascetic that he seek not god outside himself eckhart's works edited by pfeiffer volume one page six twenty six but also very naively exhibited by eckhart's spiritual daughter who sought him out when she had experienced that conversion in herself to cry out joyfully to him sir rejoice with me i have become god page four sixty five the mysticism of the sufis also expresses itself throughout precisely in accordance with this spirit principally as a revelling in the consciousness that one is oneself the kernel of the world and the source of all existence to which all returns certainly there also often appears the call to surrender all volition as the only way in which deliverance from individual existence and its suffering is possible yet subordinated and required as something easy in the mysticism of the hindus on the other hand the latter side comes out much more strongly and in christian mysticism it is quite predominant so that pantheistic consciousness which is essential to all mysticism here only appears in a secondary manner in consequence of the surrender of all volition as union with god corresponding to this difference of the conception mohammedan mysticism has a very serene character christian mysticism a gloomy and melancholy character while that of the hindus standing above both in this respect also holds the mean quietism that is surrender of all volition asceticism that is intentional mortification of one's own will and mysticism that is consciousness of the identity of one's own nature with that of all things or with the kernel of the world stand in the closest connection 
so that whoever professes one of them is gradually led to accept the others even against his intention nothing can be more surprising than the agreement with each other of the writers who present these doctrines notwithstanding the greatest difference of their age country and religion accompanied by the firm certainty and inward confidence with which they set forth the permanence of their inner experience they do not constitute a sect which adheres to defends and propagates a favourite dogma once laid hold of indeed the indian christian and mohammedan mystics quietists and ascetics are different in every respect except the inner significance and spirit of their teaching a very striking example of this is afforded by the comparison of the torrent of madame de guillon with the teaching of the vedas especially with the passage in the upnekat volume one page sixty three which contains the content of that french work in the briefest form but accurately and even with the same images and yet could not possibly have been known to madame de guillon in sixteen eighty in the deutschen theologie the only unmutilated edition stuttgart eighteen fifty one it is said in chapters two and three that both the fall of the devil and that of adam consisted in the fact that the one as the other ascribed to himself the i and me the mine and to me and on page eighty nine it is said in true love there remains neither i nor me mine to me thou thine and the like now corresponding to this it is said in the kural from the tamilian by grau page eight the passion of the mine directed outwardly and that of the i directed inwardly cease compare verse three forty six and in the manual of buddhism by spence hardy page two fifty eight buddha says my disciples reject the thoughts i am this or this is mine in general if we look away from the forms which are introduced by external circumstances and go to the bottom of the matter we will find that sakyamuni and meister eckhart teach the same only that the former dared to express his thoughts directly while the latter is obliged to clothe them in the garments of the christian myth and adapt his expressions to this he carries this however so far that with him the christian myth has become little more than a symbolical language just as the hellenic myth became for the neoplatonists he takes it throughout allegorically in the same respect it is worth noticing that the transition of st francis from prosperity to the mendicant life is similar to the still greater step of buddha sakyamuni from prince to beggar and that corresponding to this the life of st francis and also the order he founded was just a kind of sannyasism indeed it deserves to be mentioned that his relationship with the indian spirit appears also in his great love for the brutes and frequent intercourse with them when he always calls them his sisters and brothers and his beautiful cantico also bears witness to his inborn indian spirit by the praise of the sun the moon the stars the wind the water the fire and the earth even the christian quietists must often have had little or no knowledge of each other for example molinos and madame de guillon of tauler and the deutsche theologie or gichtel of the former in any case the great difference of their culture in that some of them like molinos were learned others like gichtel and many more were the reverse has no essential influence upon their teaching their great internal agreement along with the firmness and certainty of their utterances proves all the more that they speak from real inward experience from an experience which certainly is not accessible to all but is possessed only by a few favoured individuals and therefore has received the name of the work of grace the reality of which however for the above reasons is not to be doubted but in order to understand all this one must read the mystics themselves and not be contented with second-hand reports of them for every one must himself be comprehended before one judges concerning him thus to become acquainted with quietism i specially recommend meister eckhart the deutsche theologie tauler madame de guillon antoinette borion the english bunyan molinos and gichtel in the same way as practical proofs and examples of the profound seriousness of asceticism the life of pascal edited by reuchlin together with his history of the port royal and also the histoire de sainte elisabeth par le comte de montalembert and la vie de rance 
par chateaubriand are very well worth reading but yet by no means exhaust all that is important in this class whoever has read such writings and compared their spirit with that of asceticism and quietism as it runs through all works of brahmanism and buddhism and speaks in every page will admit that every philosophy which must in consistency reject that whole mode of thought which it can only do by explaining the representatives of it to be either impostors or madmen must just on this account necessarily be false but all european systems with the exception of mine find themselves in this position truly it must be an extraordinary madness which under the most widely different circumstances and persons possible spoke with such agreement and moreover was raised to the position of a chief doctrine of their religion by the most ancient and numerous peoples of the earth something like three-fourths of all the inhabitants of asia but no philosophy can leave the theme of quietism and asceticism undecided if the question is proposed to it because this theme is in its matter identical with that of all metaphysics and ethics here then is a point upon which i expect and desire that every philosophy with its optimism should declare itself and if in the judgment of contemporaries the paradoxical and unexampled agreement of my philosophy with quietism and asceticism appears as an open stumbling-block i on the contrary see just in that agreement a proof of its sole correctness and truth and also a ground of explanation of why it is ignored and kept secret by the protestant universities for not only the religions of the east but also true christianity has throughout that ascetic fundamental character which my philosophy explains as the denial of the will to live although protestantism especially in its present form seeks to conceal this yet even the open enemies of christianity who have appeared in the most recent times have ascribed to it the doctrines of renunciation self-denial perfect chastity and in general mortification of the will which they quite correctly denote by the name of the anti-cosmic tendency and have fully proved that such doctrines are essentially proper to original and genuine christianity in this they are undeniably right but that they set up this as an evident and patent reproach to christianity while just here lies its profoundest truth its high value and its sublime character this shows an obscuring of the mind which can only be explained by the fact that these men's minds unfortunately like thousands more at the present day in germany are completely spoiled and distorted by the miserable hegelism that school of dullness that centre of misunderstanding and ignorance that mind-destroying spurious wisdom which now at last begins to be recognized as such and the veneration of which will soon be left to the danish academy in whose eyes even that gross charlatan is a summus philosophus for whom it takes the field car ils suivront la créance et testude de l'ignorant et saute multitude dont le plus lord sera ressa pour juge rabelais in any case the ascetic tendency is unmistakable in the genuine and original christianity as it developed in the writings of the church fathers from its kernel in the new testament it is the summit towards which all strives upwards as its chief doctrine we find the recommendation of genuine and pure celibacy this first and most important step in the denial of the will to live which is already expressed in the new testament strauss also in his life of jesus volume one page six eighteen of the first edition says with reference to the recommendation of celibacy given in matthew nineteen eleven and following that the doctrine of jesus may not run counter to the ideas of the present day men have hastened to introduce surreptitiously the thought that jesus only prays celibacy with reference to the circumstances of the time and in order to leave the activity of the apostles unfettered but there is even less indication of this in the context than in the kindred passage first corinthians seven twenty five and following but we have here again one of the places where ascetic principles such as prevailed among the essenes and probably still more widely among the jews appear in the teaching of jesus also this ascetic tendency appears more decidedly later than at the beginning when christianity still seeking adherence dared not pitch its demands too high and by the beginning of the third century it is expressly urged 
marriage in genuine christianity is merely a compromise with the sinful nature of man as a concession something allowed to those who lack strength to aspire to the highest an expedient to avoid greater evil in this sense it receives the sanction of the church in order that the bond may be indissoluble but celibacy and virginity are set up as the higher consecration of christianity through which one enters the ranks of the elect through these alone does one attain the victor's crown which even at the present day is signified by the wreath upon the coffin of the unmarried and also by that which the bride lays aside on the day of her marriage a piece of evidence upon this point which certainly comes to us from the primitive times of christianity is the pregnant answer of the lord quoted by clemens alexandrinus stromata three six and nine from the gospel of the egyptians t salomi ucurios puntha nomini mechri pote thanatos iscuse mechris an apen umes ai gunaikes tictete that is salomai interroganti quosque vigebit mors dominus guadlusque inguit vos mulieres paritis tut esti mechris an ai epithumiae energosi that is hoc est quam diu operabuntur cupiditates adds clement chapter nine with which he at once connects the famous passage romans five twelve further on chapter thirteen he quotes the words of cassianus puntha nominis tis salomis pote gnos fisetai taperi on ireto effi o curias otan tis aiscuns en duma patisete kai otan genitai ta duo en kai to aren meta tis phileas ute aren ute philu that is cum interrogaret salome quando cognuscentur ea de quibus interrogabat ait dominus quando pudoris indumentum conculcaveritis et quando duo facto fuerint unum et masculum nec faeminium that is when she no longer needs the veil of modesty since all distinction of sex will have disappeared end of chapter forty eight part two recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty eight part three of supplements to the fourth book from the world as will and idea volume three by arthur schopenhauer translated by r b haldane and j kemp this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty eight on the doctrine of the denial of the will to live part three with regard to this point the heretics have certainly gone furthest even in the second century the tatianites or the encratites the gnostics the marcionites the montanists valentinians and cassians yet only because with reckless consistency they gave honour to the truth and therefore in accordance with the spirit of christianity they taught perfect continence while the church prudently declared to be heresy all that ran counter to its far-seeing policy augustine says of the tatianites nuptias damnant atque omnino pares eas fornicationibus aliisque corruptionibus faciunt nec recipiunt in sum numerum conjugio utentem sive marem sive feminam non vescunlur carnibus easque abominantur de hiresi ad quod vult deum twenty five but even the orthodox fathers look upon marriage in the light indicated above and zealously preach entire continence the agnea athanasius gives as the cause of marriage oti upopiptontes es men tu propatoros catadici epedi o proigumenas scapas tu theu in tomidia gamu genesthai imas caiphathoras ide 
parabasis tis entoris to gamon esigagen dia to anuisai ton adam that is quia sub iacemus condemnationi propatoris nostri nam finis adeo prilatus erat nos non per nuptias et corruptionem fieri sed transgressio mandati nuptias introduxit propter legis violationem adi expositions in the psalms fifty tertullian calls marriage genus mali inferioris ex indulgentia ortum de pudicitia chapter sixteen and says matrimonium et stuptrum est commixtio carnis scilicet cuius concupiscentiam dominus stuptro adiquavit ergo inguis iam et primas id est unas nuptias destruis nec immerito quoniam et ipsi ex eo constant quod est stuptrum indeed augustine himself commits himself entirely to this doctrine in all its results for he says novi quostam qui mumurent quid si inquiunt omnes velint ab omni concubitu abstinere unde subsistet genus humanum utinam omnes hoc velent dum taxat in caritate de corde puro et conscientia bona et fide non ficta multo citius dei civitas compleretur et accelet ut acceleraretur terminus mundi de bono conjugali chapter ten and again non vos ab hoc studio quo multos ad imitandum vos excitatis frangat querela vanorum qui dicunt quo modo subsistet genus humanum si omnes fuerint continentes quasi propter aliud retardetur hoc seculum nisi ut impleatur predestinatus numerus ille sanctorum coquitius impleto profecto nec terminus seculi differetur de bono individuitatis chapter twenty three one sees at once that he identifies salvation with the end of the world the other passages in the works of augustine which bear on this point will be found collected in the confessio augustiniana di augustini operibus compilata a hieronimo torrense sixteen ten under the headings de matrimonio de celibato etc and any one may convince himself from these that in ancient genuine christianity marriage was only a concession which besides this was supposed to have only the begetting of children as its end that on the other hand perfect continence was the true virtue far to be preferred to this to those however who do not wish to go back to the authorities themselves i recommend two works for the purpose of removing any kind of doubt as to the tendency of christianity we are speaking about carove uber das culibat gesetzt eighteen thirty two and lint de culibatu christianorum pertria priora secula havnii eighteen thirty nine it is however by no means the views of these writers themselves to which i refer for these are opposed to mine but solely to their carefully collected accounts and quotations which deserve full acceptance as quite trustworthy just because both these writers are opponents of celibacy the former a rationalistic catholic and the other a protestant candidate in theology who speaks exactly like one in the first named work we find volume one page one sixty six in that reference the following result expressed quote, in accordance with the church view as it may be read in canonical church fathers in the synodo and papal instructions and in innumerable writings of orthodox catholics perpetual chastity is called a divine heavenly angelic virtue and the obtaining of the assistance of divine grace for this end is made dependent upon earnest prayer we have already shown that this augustinian doctrine is by canisius and in the decrees of the council of trent 
expressed as an unchanging belief of the church that however it has been retained as a dogma till the present day is sufficiently established by the june number eighteen thirty one of the magazine der catholique it is said there page two sixty three quote, in catholicism the observance of a perpetual chastity for the sake of god appears as in itself the highest merit of man the view that the observance of continual chastity as an end in itself sanctifies and exalts the man is as every instructed catholic is convinced deeply rooted in christianity both as regards its spirit and its express precepts the decrees of the council of trent have abolished all possible doubt on this point it must at any rate be confessed by every unprejudiced person not only that the doctrine expressed by der catholique is really catholic but also that the proofs adduced may be quite irrefutable for a catholic reason because they are drawn so directly from the ecclesiastical view taken by the church of life and its destiny it is further said in the same work page two seventy although both paul calls the forbidding to marry a false doctrine and the still judaistic author of the epistle to the hebrews enjoins that marriage shall be held in honour by all and the bed kept undefiled hebrews thirteen four yet the main tendency of these two sacred writers is not on that account to be mistaken virginity is for both the perfect state marriage only a makeshift for the weak and only as such to be held inviolable the highest effort on the other hand was directed to complete material putting off of self the self must turn and refrain from all that tends only to its own pleasure and that only temporarily lastly page two eighty eight we agree with the abbe zakaria who asserts that celibacy not the law of celibacy is before everything to be deduced from the teaching of christ and the apostle paul what is opposed to this specially christian view is everywhere and always merely the old testament with its panta kala leon this appears with peculiar distinctness from that important third book of the stromata of clement where arguing against the encratistic heretics mentioned above he constantly opposes to them only judaism with its optimistic history of creation with which the world-denying tendency of the new testament is certainly in contradiction but the connection of the new testament with the old is at bottom only external accidental and forced and the one point at which christian doctrine can link itself on to the latter is only to be found as has been said in the story of the fall which moreover stands quite isolated in the old testament and is made no further use of but in accordance with the account in the gospels it is just the orthodox adherence of the old testament who bring about the crucifixion of the founder of christianity because they find his teaching in conflict with their own in the said third book of the stromata of clement the antagonism between optimism with theism on the one hand and pessimism with ascetic morality on the other comes out with surprising distinctness this book is directed against the gnostics who just taught pessimism and asceticism that is egkrateia abstinence of every kind but especially from all sexual satisfaction on account of which clement censures them vigorously but at the same time it becomes apparent that even the spirit of the old testament stands in this antagonism with that of the new testament for apart from the fall which appears in the old testament like an hors d'oeuvre the spirit of the old testament is diametrically opposed to that of the new testament the former optimistic the latter pessimistic clement himself brings this contradiction out prominently at the end of the eleventh chapter prosapo te nomenon tan paulon to christi although he will not allow that it is a real contradiction but explains it as only apparent like a good jew as he is in general it is interesting to see how with clement the new and old testaments get mixed up together and he strives to reconcile them yet for the most part drives out the new testament with the old just at the beginning of the third chapter he objects to the marcionites that they find fault with the creation after the example of plato and pythagoras for marcion teaches that nature is bad made out of bad materials psusis kaki ecte ulis kakis therefore one ought not to people this world but to abstain from marriage mi bule menoi ton cosmon sum plirun apekesthai gamu 
now clement to whom in general the old testament is much more congenial and convincing than the new takes this very much amiss he sees in it their flagrant ingratitude to and enmity and rebellion against him who has made the world the just demiurgus whose work they themselves are and yet despise the use of his creatures in impious rebellion forsaking the natural opinion antitasomenoi to poiti tosphon egrates ti pros ton pepoikota ekthra mi bulomenoi christai tois up autu christhesin asebe seomachia ton kata psusin ekotantes logismoi at the same time in his holy zeal he will not allow the marcionites even the honour of originality but armed with his well-known erudition he brings it against them and supports his case with the most beautiful quotations that even the ancient philosophers that heraclitus and empedocles pythagoras and plato orpheus and pindar herodotus and euripides and also the sibyls lamented deeply the wretched nature of the world thus taught pessimism now in this learned enthusiasm he does not observe that in this way he is just giving the marcionites water for their mill for he shows that all the wisest of all the ages have taught and sung what they do but confidently and boldly he quotes the most decided and energetic utterances of the ancients in this sense certainly they cannot lead him astray wise men may mourn the sadness of existence poets may pour out the most affecting lamentations about it nature and experience may cry out as loudly as they will against optimism all this does not touch our church father he holds his jewish revelation in his hand and remains confident the demiurgus made the world from this it is a priori certain that it is excellent and it may look as it likes the same thing then takes place with regard to the second point the ekrateia through which according to his view the marcionites show their ingratitude towards the demiurgus akarisen to demiurgo and the perversity with which they put from them all his gifts di antitadzin proston dimiurgon tin krisin ton kosmikon paraitumenoi here now the tragic poets have preceded the encratites to the prejudice of their originality and have said the same things for since they also lament the infinite misery of existence they have added that it is better to bring no children into such a world which he now again supports with the most beautiful passages and at the same time accuses the pythagoreans of having renounced sexual pleasure on this ground but all this touches him not he sticks to his principle that all these sin against the demiurgus and that they teach that one ought not to marry ought not to beget children ought not to bring new miserable beings into the world ought not to provide new food for death egrateas asebusi estetin krisin kai ton agion dimiurgon ton pantokratora monon theon kai didaskusi midein paradekesthai gamon kai paidopoian mide antesa antesagen to cosmo dustuki suntas eterus mide epikorigen panato trophin chapter six since the learned church father thus denounces ekrateia he seems to have had no presentiment that just after his time the celibacy of the christian priesthood would be more and more introduced and finally in the eleventh century raised to the position of a law because it is in keeping with the spirit of the new testament it is just this spirit which the gnostics have grasped most profoundly and understood better than our church father who is more jew than christian the conception of the gnostics comes out very clearly at the beginning of the ninth chapter where the following passage is quoted from the gospel of the egyptians autos apen osotir ilthon katalusai da erga tis phileas phileas men tis epithumias erga de genesin kai phthoran that is aiunt enim dixisse servatorem veni ad dissolvendum opera feminae feminae quidem cupiditatis opera autem generationem et interitum but quite specially at the end of the thirteenth and the beginning of the fourteenth chapter 
the church certainly was obliged to consider how to set a religion upon its legs that could also walk and stand in the world as it is and among men therefore it declared these persons to be heretics at the conclusion of the seventh chapter our church father opposes indian asceticism as bad to christian judaism whereby the fundamental difference of the spirit of the two religions is clearly brought out in judaism and christianity everything runs back to obedience or disobedience to the command of god upakoi kai parakoi as befits us creatures imin tois peplasmenois upo tistu pantokrateros buliseos that is nobis qui omnipotentis voluntate efficti sumus chapter fourteen then comes as a second duty patreuen theo zonti to serve god extol his works and overflow with thankfulness certainly the matter has a very different aspect in brahmanism and buddhism for in the latter all improvement and conversion and the only deliverance we can hope for from this world of suffering this sansara proceeds from the knowledge of the four fundamental truths one dolor two dolores ortus three dolorus interitus four octopartita via a doloris sedationem from dhammapadam faustbull edition page thirty five and three forty seven the explanation of these four truths will be found in burnouf introduction à l'histoire du bouddhisme page six twenty nine and in all expositions of buddhism in truth judaism with its panta kala leon is not related to christianity as regards its spirit and ethical tendency but brahmanism and buddhism are but the spirit and ethical tendency are what is essential in a religion not the myths in which these are clothed i therefore cannot give up the belief that the doctrines of christianity can in some way be derived from these primitive religions i have pointed out some traces of this in the second volume of the Pererga, section one seventy nine second edition section one eighty i have to add to these that epiphanias hieretic eighteen relates that the first jewish christians of jerusalem who called themselves nazarenes refrained from all animal food on account of this origin or at least this agreement christianity belongs to the ancient true and sublime faith of mankind which is opposed to the false shallow and injurious optimism which exhibits itself in greek paganism judaism and islamism the zent religion holds to a certain extent the mean because it has opposed to ormuzd a pessimistic counterpoise in ahriman from this zent religion the jewish religion proceeded as j g rode has thoroughly proved in his book die heilige sage des zentvolks from ormuzd has come jehovah and from ahriman satan who however plays only a very subordinate role in judaism indeed almost entirely disappears whereby then optimism gains the upper hand and there only remains the myth of the fall as a pessimistic element which certainly as the fable of messia and messiane is derived from the zent avesta yet even this falls into oblivion till it is again taken up by christianity along with satan ormuzd himself however is derived from brahmanism although from a lower region of it he is no other than indra that subordinate god of the firmament and the atmosphere who is represented as frequently in rivalry with men this has been very clearly shown by j j schmidt in his work on the relation of the gnostic theosophic doctrines to the religions of the east this indra ormuz jehovah had afterwards to pass over into christianity because this religion arose in judea but on account of the cosmopolitan character of christianity he laid aside his own name to be denoted in the language of each converted nation by the appellation of the superhuman beings he supplanted as theos deus which comes from the sanskrit deva from which also devil comes or among the gothico germanic peoples by the word god got which comes from odin woden guodan godan in the same way he assumed in islamism which also sprang from judaism the name of allah which also existed earlier in arabia analogous to this the gods of the greek olympus when in prehistoric times they were transplanted to italy also assumed the names of the previously reigning gods hence among the romans zeus is called jupiter hera juno hermes mercury etc in china the first difficulty of the missionaries arose from the fact that the chinese language has no appellation of the kind 
and also no word for creating for the three religions of china know no gods either in the plural or in the singular however the rest may be that pantakala leon of the old testament is really foreign to true christianity for in the new testament the world is always spoken of as something to which one does not belong which one does not love nay whose lord is the devil this agrees with the ascetic spirit of the denial of oneself and the overcoming of the world which just like the boundless love of one's neighbour even of one's enemy is the fundamental characteristic which christianity has in common with brahmanism and buddhism and which proves their relationship there is nothing in which one has to distinguish the kernel so carefully from the shell as in christianity just because i prize this kernel highly i sometimes treat the shell with little ceremony it is however thicker than is generally supposed protestantism since it has eliminated asceticism and its central point the meritoriousness of celibacy has already given up the inmost kernel of christianity and so far as to be regarded as a falling away from it this has become apparent in our own day by the gradual transition of protestantism into shallow rationalism this modern pelagianism which ultimately degenerates into the doctrine of a loving father who has made the world in order that things may go on very pleasantly in it in which case then he must certainly have failed and who if one only conforms to his will in certain respects will also afterwards provide a still more beautiful world with regard to which it is only a pity that it has such a fatal entrance that may be a good religion for comfortable married and enlightened protestant pastors but it is no christianity christianity is the doctrine of the deep guilt of the human race through its existence alone and the longing of the heart for deliverance from it which however can only be attained by the greatest sacrifices and by the denial of one's own self thus by an entire reversal of human nature luther may have been perfectly right from the practical point of view that is with reference to the church scandal of his time which he wished to remove but not so from the theoretical point of view the more sublime a doctrine is the more it is exposed to abuse at the hands of human nature which on the whole is of a low and evil disposition hence the abuses of catholicism are so much more numerous and so much greater than those of protestantism thus for example monasticism that methodical denial of the will practised in common for the sake of mutual encouragement is an institution of a sublime description which however for this very reason is for the most part untrue to its spirit the shocking abuses of the church excited in the honest mind of luther a lofty indignation but in consequence of this he was led to desire to limit as much as possible the claims of christianity itself and for this end he first confined it to the words of the bible but then in his well-meant zeal he went too far for he attacked the very heart of christianity in the ascetic principle for after the withdrawal of the ascetic principle the optimistic principle soon necessarily took its place but in religions as in philosophy optimism is a fundamental error which obstructs the path of all truth from all this it seems to me that catholicism is a shamefully abused for protestantism a degenerate christianity thus that christianity in general has met the fate which befalls all that is noble sublime and great whenever it has to dwell among men end of chapter forty eight section three recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty eight part four of supplements to the fourth book from the world as will and idea volume three by arthur schopenhauer translated by r b haldane and j kemp this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty eight on the doctrine of the denial of the will to live section four however even in the very lap of protestantism the essentially ascetic and encratistic spirit of christianity has made way for itself and in this case it has appeared in a phenomenon which perhaps has never before been equalled in magnitude and definiteness the highly remarkable sect of the shakers in north america founded by an englishwoman anne lee in seventeen seventy four the adherents of this sect 
have already increased to six thousand who are divided into fifteen communities and inhabit a number of villages in the states of new york and kentucky especially in the district of new lebanon near nassau village the fundamental characteristic of their religious rule of life is celibacy and entire abstention from all sexual satisfaction it is unanimously admitted even by the english and americans who visit them and who laugh and jeer at them in every other respect that this rule is strictly and with perfect honesty observed although brothers and sisters sometimes even occupy the same house eat at the same table nay dance together in the religious services in church for whoever has made that hardest of all sacrifices may dance before the lord he is a victor he is overcome their singing in church consists in general of cheerful and partly even of merry songs the church dance also which follows the sermon is accompanied by the singing of the rest it is a lively dance performed in measured time and concludes with a galop which is carried on till the dancers are exhausted between each dance one of their teachers cries aloud think that ye rejoice before the lord for having slain your flesh for this is here the only use we make of our refractory limbs to celibacy most of the other conditions link themselves on of themselves there are no families and therefore there is no private property but community of goods all are clothed alike in quaker fashion and with great neatness they are industrious and diligent idleness is not endured they have also the enviable rule that they are to avoid all unnecessary noise such as shouting door slamming whip cracking loud knocking etc their rule of life has been thus expressed by one of them lead a life of innocence and purity love your neighbours as yourself live at peace with all men and refrain from war bloodshed and all violence against others as well as from all striving after worldly honour and distinction give to each his own and follow after holiness without which no man can see the lord do good to all so far as your opportunity and your power extends they persuade no one to join them but test those who present themselves by a novitiate of several years moreover every one is free to leave them very rarely is any one expelled for misconduct adopted children are carefully educated and only when they are grown up do they voluntarily join the sect it is said that in the controversies of their ministers with anglican clergy the latter generally come off the worse for the arguments consist of passages from the new testament fuller accounts of them will be found particularly in maxwell's run through the united states eighteen forty one also in benedict's history of all religions eighteen thirty also in the times november fourth eighteen thirty seven and in the german magazine columbus may number eighteen thirty one a german sect in america very similar to them who also live in strict celibacy and continence are the rapists an account of them is given in f loher's geschichte und zustande der deutschen in amerika eighteen fifty three in russia also the raskolniks are a similar sect the gichtelians live also in strict chastity but among the ancient jews we already find a prototype of all these sects the essenes of whom even pliny gives an account and who resembled the shakers very much not only in celibacy but also in other respects for example in dancing during divine service which leads to the opinion that the founder of the shakers took the essenes as a pattern in the presence of such facts as these how does luther's assertion look ubi natura quae mod modum a deo nobis incita est fertur ac rapitur fieri nullo modo potest ut extra matrimonium cas vivitur although christianity in essential respects taught only what all asia knew long before and even better yet for europe it was a new and great revelation in consequence of which the spiritual tendency of the european nations was therefore entirely transformed for it disclosed to them the metaphysical significance of existence and therefore taught them to look away from the narrow paltry ephemeral life of earth and to regard it no longer as an end in itself but as a condition of suffering guilt trial conflict and purification out of which by means of moral achievements 
difficult renunciation and denial of oneself one may rise to a better existence which is inconceivable by us it taught the great truth of the assertion and denial of the will to live in the clothing of allegory by saying that through adam's fall the curse has come upon all sin has come into the world and guilt is inherited by all but that on the other hand through the sacrificial death of jesus all are reconciled the world saved guilt abolished and justice satisfied in order however to understand the truth itself that is contained in this myth one must not regard men simply in time as beings independent of each other but must comprehend the platonic idea of man which is related to the series of men as eternity in itself is related to eternity drawn out as time hence the eternal idea man extended in time to the series of men through the connecting bond of generation appears again in time as a whole if now we keep the idea of man in view we see that adam's fall represents the finite animal sinful nature of man in respect of which he is a finite being exposed to sin suffering and death on the other hand the life teaching and death of jesus christ represent the eternal supernatural side the freedom the salvation of man now every man as such and potentia is both adam and jesus according as he comprehends himself and his will thereupon determines him in consequence of which he is then condemned and given over to death or saved and attains to eternal life now these truths both in their allegorical and in their real acceptation were completely new as far as greeks and romans were concerned who were still entirely absorbed in life and did not seriously look beyond it let whoever doubts this see how cicero cluentio chapter sixty one and sallust in catullus chapter forty seven speak of the state after death the ancients although far advanced in almost everything else remained children with regard to the chief concern and were surpassed in this even by the druids who at least taught metempsychosis that one or two philosophers like pythagoras and plato thought otherwise alters nothing as regards the whole that great fundamental truth then which is contained in christianity as in brahmanism and buddhism the need of deliverance from an existence which is given up to suffering and death and the attainableness of this by the denial of the will thus by a decided opposition to nature is beyond all comparison the most important truth there can be but at the same time it is entirely opposed to the natural tendency of the human race and in its true grounds it is difficult to comprehend as indeed all that can only be thought generally and in the abstract is inaccessible to the great majority of men therefore for these men there was everywhere required in order to bring that great truth within the sphere of its practical application a mythical vehicle for it as it were a receptacle without which it would be lost and dissipated the truth had therefore everywhere to borrow the garb of the fable and also constantly to endeavour to connect itself with what in each case was historically given already familiar and already revered what sensu proprio remained inaccessible to the great mass of mankind of all ages and lands with their low tone of mind their intellectual stupidity and general brutality had for practical purposes to be brought home to them sensu allegorico in order to become their guiding star so then the religions mentioned above are to be regarded as the sacred vessels in which the great truth known and expressed for several thousand years indeed perhaps since the beginning of the human race which yet in itself for the great mass of mankind always remains a mystery is according to the measure of their powers made accessible to them preserved and transmitted through the centuries yet because all that does not through and through consist of the imperishable material of pure truth is subject to destruction whenever this fate befalls such a vessel through contact with a heterogeneous age its sacred content must in some way be saved and preserved for mankind by another but it is the task of philosophy since it is one with pure truth to present that content pure and unmixed thus merely in abstract conceptions 
and consequently without that vehicle for those who are capable of thinking who are always an exceedingly small number it is therefore related to religions as a straight line to several curves running near it for it expresses sensu proprio thus reaches directly what they show in veiled forms and reach by circuitous routes if now in order to illustrate what has just been said by an example and also to follow a philosophical fashion of my time i should wish perhaps to attempt to solve the profoundest mystery of christianity that of the trinity in the fundamental conception of my philosophy this could be done with a license permitted in such interpretations in the following manner the holy ghost is the distinct denial of the will to live the man in whom this exhibits itself in concreto is the son he is identical with the will which asserts life and thereby produces the phenomenon of this perceptible world that is with the father because the assertion and denial are opposite acts of the same will whose capability for both is the only true freedom however this is to be regarded as a mere lusus ingeni before i close this chapter i wish to adduce a few proofs in support of what in section sixty eight of the first volume i denoted by the expression duturas plus the bringing about of the denial of the will by one's own deeply felt suffering thus not merely by the appropriation of the suffering of others and the knowledge of the vanity and wretchedness of our existence introduced by this we can arrive at a comprehension of what goes on in the heart of a man in the case of an elevation of this kind and the accompanying purifying process by considering what every emotional man experiences on beholding a tragedy which is of kindred nature to this in the third and fourth acts perhaps such a man is distressed and disturbed by the ever more clouded and threatened happiness of the hero but when in the fifth act this happiness is entirely wrecked and shattered he experiences a certain elevation of the soul which affords him an infinitely higher kind of pleasure than the sight of the happiness of the hero however great it might be could ever have given now this is the same thing in the weak water-colours of sympathy which is able to raise a well-known illusion as that which takes place with the energy of reality in the feeling of our own fate when it is heavy misfortune that drives the man at last into the haven of entire resignation upon this occurrence depend all those conversions which completely transform men such as are described in the text i may give here in a few words the story of the conversion of the abbe ronce as it is strikingly similar to that of raymond lully which is told in the text and besides this is memorable on account of its result his youth was devoted to enjoyment and pleasure finally he lived in a relation of passion with a madame de montbazon one evening when he visited her he found her room empty in disorder and darkness he struck something with his foot it was her head which had been severed from the trunk because after her sudden death her corpse could not otherwise be got into the lead coffin that stood beside it after overcoming an immense sorrow Ronce now became in sixteen sixty three the reformer of the order of the trappists which at that time had entirely relaxed the strictness of its rules he joined this order and through him it was led back to that terrible degree of renunciation which is still maintained at the present day at la trappe and as the methodically carried out denial of the will aided by the severest renunciation and an incredibly hard and painful manner of life fills the visitor with sacred awe after he has been touched at his reception by the humility of these genuine monks who emaciated by fasting by cold by night watches prayers and penances kneel before him the worldling and the sinner to implore his blessing of all orders of monks this one alone has maintained itself in perfection in france through all changes which is to be attributed to the profound earnestness which in it is unmistakable and excludes all secondary ends it has remained untouched even by the decline of religion because its root lies deeper in human nature than any positive system of belief i have mentioned in the text that this great and rapid change of the inmost being of man which we are here considering and which has hitherto been entirely neglected by philosophers 
appears most frequently when with full consciousness he stands in the presence of a violent and certain death thus in the case of executions but in order to bring this process much more distinctly before our eyes i regard it as by no means unbecoming to the dignity of philosophy to quote what has been said by some criminals before their execution even at the risk of incurring the sneer that i encourage gallows sermons i certainly rather believe that the gallows is a place of quite peculiar revelations and a watch-tower from which the man who even then retains his presence of mind obtains a wider clearer outlook into eternity than most philosophers over the paragraphs of their rational psychology and theology the following speech on the gallows was made on the fifteenth april eighteen thirty seven at gloucester by a man called bartlett who had murdered his mother-in-law englishmen and fellow-countrymen i have a few words to say to you and they shall be but very few yet let me entreat you one and all that these few words that i shall utter may strike deep into your hearts bear them in your mind not only now while you are witnessing this sad scene but take them to your homes take them and repeat them to your children and friends i implore you as a dying man one for whom the instrument of death is even now prepared and these words are that you may loose yourselves from the love of this dying world and its vain pleasures think less of it and more of your god do this repent repent for be assured that without deep and true repentance without turning to your heavenly father you will never attain nor can hold the slightest hope of ever reaching those bowers of bliss to which i trust i am now fast advancing End quote. times eighteenth april eighteen thirty seven still more remarkable are the last words of the well-known murderer greenacre who was executed in london on the first of may eighteen thirty seven the english newspaper the post gives the following account which is also reprinted in galignani's messenger of the sixth of may eighteen thirty seven Quote, on the morning of his execution a gentleman advised him to put his trust in god and pray for forgiveness through the mediation of jesus christ greenacre replied that forgiveness through the mediation of christ was a matter of opinion for his part he believed that in the sight of the highest being a mohammedan was as good as a christian and had just as much claim to salvation since his imprisonment he had had his attention directed to theological subjects and he had become convinced that the gallows is a passport to heaven End quote. the indifference displayed here towards positive religions is just what gives this utterance greater weight for it shows that it is no fanatical delusion but individual immediate knowledge that lies at its foundation the following incident may also be mentioned which is given by galignani's messenger of the fifteenth august eighteen thirty seven from the limerick chronicle quote, last monday maria cooney was executed for the revolting murder of mrs anderson so deeply was this wretched woman impressed with the greatness of her crime that she kissed the rope which was put round her neck while she humbly implored the mercy of god lastly this the times of the twenty ninth april eighteen forty five gives several letters which hawker who was condemned for the murder of de la rue wrote the day before his execution in one of these he says i am persuaded that unless the natural heart be broken and renewed by divine mercy however noble and amiable it may be deemed by the world it can never think of eternity without inwardly shuddering these are the outlooks into eternity referred to above which are obtained from that watch-tower and i have had the less hesitation in giving them here since shakespeare also says out of these convertites there is much matter to be heard and learned as you like it last scene strauss in his life of jesus has proved that christianity also ascribes to suffering as such the purifying and sanctifying power here set forth laban jesu volume one chapter six sections seventy two and seventy four he says that the beatitudes in the sermon on the mount have a different sense in luke six twenty one from that which they have in matthew five three for only the latter adds to penustai penumati to makarioi oi patochoi and tin dikaiasunin to penontes thus by him alone are the simple-minded 
the humble etc meant while by luke are meant the literally poor so that here the contrast is that between present suffering and future happiness with the ebionites it is a capital principle that whoever takes his portion in this age gets nothing in the future and conversely accordingly in luke the blessings are followed by as many ouai woes which are addressed to the rich oi plusioi the full oi empeplismenoi and to them that laugh o gelontes in the ebionite spirit in the same spirit he says page six o four is the parable luke sixteen nineteen of the rich man and lazarus given which nowhere mentions any fault of the former or any merit of the latter and takes as the standard of the future recompense not the good done or the wickedness practised but the evil suffered here and the good things enjoyed in the ebionite spirit a like estimation of outward poverty strauss goes on is also attributed to jesus by the other synoptists matthew nineteen sixteen mark ten seventeen luke eighteen eighteen in the story of the rich young man and the saying about the camel in the eye of a needle if we go to the bottom of the matter we will recognize that even in the most famous passages of the sermon on the mount there is contained an indirect injunction to voluntary poverty and thereby to the denial of the will to live for the precept matthew five forty and following to consent unconditionally to all demands made upon us to give our cloak also to him who will take away our coat etc similarly matthew six twenty five to thirty four the precept to cast aside all care for the future even for the morrow and so to live simply in the present are rules of life the observance of which inevitably leads to absolute poverty and which therefore just say in an indirect manner what buddha directly commands his disciples and has confirmed by his own example throw everything away and become bhikkhu that is beggars this appears still more decidedly in the passage matthew ten nine through fifteen where all possessions even shoes and a staff are forbidden to the apostles and they are directed to beg these commands afterwards became the foundation of the mendicant order of saint francis bonaventurae vita st francisci chapter three hence then i say that the spirit of christian ethics is identical with that of brahmanism and buddhism in conformity with the whole view expounded here meister eckhart also says works volume one page four ninety two the swiftest animal that bears thee to perfection is suffering end of chapter forty eight recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty nine of supplements to the fourth book from the world as will and idea volume three by arthur schopenhauer translated by r b haldane and j kemp this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty nine the way of salvation there is only one inborn error and that is that we exist in order to be happy it is inborn in us because it is one with our existence itself and our whole being is only a paraphrase of it nay our body is its monogram we are nothing more than will to live and the successive satisfaction of all our volitions is what we think in the conception of happiness as long as we persist in this inborn error indeed even become rigidly fixed in it through optimistic dogmas the world appears to us full of contradictions for at every step in great things as in small we must experience that the world and life are by no means arranged with a view to containing a happy existence while now by this the thoughtless man only finds himself tormented in reality in the case of him who thinks there is added to his real pain the theoretical perplexity why a world and a life which exist in order that one may be happy in them answer their ends so badly first of all it finds expression in pious ejaculations such as ah why are the tears on earth so many etc etc but in their train come disquieting doubts about the assumptions of those preconceived optimistic dogmas one may try if one will to throw the blame of one's individual unhappiness now upon the circumstances now upon other men 
now upon one's own bad luck or even upon one's own awkwardness and may know well how all these have worked together to produce it but this in no way alters the result that one has missed the real end of life which consists indeed in being happy the consideration of this is then often very depressing especially if life is already on the wane hence the countenances of almost all elderly persons wear the expression of that which in english is called disappointment besides this however hitherto every day of our life has taught us that joys and pleasures even if attained are in themselves delusive do not perform what they promise do not satisfy the heart and finally their possession is at least embittered by the disagreeables that accompany them or spring from them while on the contrary the pains and sorrows prove themselves very real and often exceed all expectation thus certainly everything in life is calculated to recall us from that original error and to convince us that the end of our existence is not to be happy indeed if we regard it more closely and without prejudice life rather presents itself as specially intended to be such that we shall not feel ourselves happy in it for through its whole nature it bears the character of something for which we have no taste which must be endured by us and from which we have to return as from an error that our heart may be cured of the passionate desire of enjoyment nay of life and turned away from the world in this sense it would be more correct to place the end of life in our woe than in our welfare for the considerations at the conclusion of the preceding chapter have shown that the more one suffers the sooner one attains to the true end of life and that the more happily one lives the longer this is delayed the conclusion of the last letter of seneca corresponds with this bonum tunc habebis tuum cum intelliges infelicissimos esse felices which certainly seems to show the influence of christianity the peculiar effect of the tragic drama also ultimately depends upon the fact that it shakes that inborn error by vividly presenting in a great and striking example the vanity of human effort and the nothingness of this whole existence and thus discloses the profound significance of life hence it is recognized as the sublimest form of poetry whoever now has returned by one or other path from that error which dwells in us a priori that proto pseudas of our existence will soon see all in another light and will now find the world in harmony with his insight although not with his wishes misfortunes of every kind and magnitude although they pain him will no longer surprise him for he has come to see that it is just pain and trouble that tend towards the true end of life the turning away of the will from it this will give him indeed a wonderful composedness in all that may happen similar to that with which a sick person who undergoes a long and painful cure bears the pain of it as a sign of its efficacy in the whole of human existence suffering expresses itself clearly enough as its true destiny life is deeply sunk in suffering and cannot escape from it our entrance into it takes place amid tears its course is at bottom always tragic and its end still more so there is an unmistakable appearance of intention in this as a rule man's destiny passes through his mind in a striking manner at the very summit of his desires and efforts and thus his life receives a tragic tendency by virtue of which it is fitted to free him from the passionate desire of which every individual existence is an example and bring him into such a condition that he parts with life without retaining a single desire for it and its pleasures suffering is in fact the purifying process through which alone in most cases the man is sanctified that is is led back from the path of error of the will to live in accordance with this the salutary nature of the cross and of suffering is so often explained in christian books of edification and in general the cross an instrument of suffering not of doing is very suitably the symbol of the christian religion nay even the preacher who is still jewish but so very philosophical rightly says sorrow is better than laughter for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better ecclesiastes seven three 
under the name of the dentros plus i have presented suffering as to a certain extent a substitute for virtue and holiness but here i must make the bold assertion that taking everything into consideration we have more to hope for our salvation and deliverance from what we suffer than from what we do precisely in this spirit lamartine very beautifully says in his im à la douleur apostrophizing pain tu me traites sans doute en favori des ceux car tu n'épargnes pas les larmes à mes yeux eh bien je les recrois comme tu les envoies tes mots seront mes biens et tes soupirs mes joies je sens qu'il est en toi sans avoir combattu une vertu tu divine au lieu de ma vertu que tu n'es pas l'amour l'âme mais sa vie que ton bras en frappant guérit et vivifie if then suffering itself has such a sanctifying power this will belong in an even higher degree to death which is more feared than any suffering answering to this a certain awe kindred to that which great suffering occasions us is felt in the presence of every dead person indeed every case of death presents itself to a certain extent as a kind of apotheosis or canonization therefore we cannot look upon the dead body of even the most insignificant man without awe and indeed extraordinary as the remark may sound in this place in the presence of every corpse the watch goes under arms dying is certainly to be regarded as the real aim of life in the moment of death all that is decided for which the whole course of life was only the preparation and introduction death is the result the resume of life or the added up sum which expresses at once the instruction which life gave in detail and bit by bit this that the whole striving whose manifestation in its life was a vain idle and self-contradictory effort to have returned from which is a deliverance as the whole slow vegetation of the plant is related to the fruit which now at a stroke achieves a hundredfold what the plant achieved gradually and bit by bit so life with its obstacles deluded hopes frustrated plans and constant suffering is related to death which at one stroke destroys all all that the man has willed and so crowns the instruction which life gave him the completed course of life upon which the dying man looks back has an effect upon the whole will that objectifies itself in this perishing individuality analogous to that which a motive exercises upon the conduct of the man it gives it a new direction which accordingly is the moral and essential result of the life just because a sudden death makes this retrospect impossible the church regards such a death as a misfortune and prays that it should be averted since this retrospect like the distinct foreknowledge of death as conditioned by the reason is possible only in man not in the brute and accordingly man alone really drinks the cup of death humanity is the only material in which the will can deny itself and entirely turn away from life to the will that does not deny itself every birth imparts a new and different intellect till it has learned the true nature of life and in consequence of this wills it no more in the natural course in age the decay of the body coincides with that of the will the desire for pleasures soon vanishes with the capacity to enjoy them the occasion of the most vehement willing the focus of the will the sexual impulse is first extinguished whereby the man is placed in a position which resembles the state of innocence which existed before the development of the genital system the illusions which set up chimeras as exceedingly desirable benefits vanish and the knowledge of the vanity of all earthly blessings takes their place selfishness is repressed by the love of one's children by means of which the man already begins to live more in the ego of others than in his own which now will soon be no more this course of life is at least the desirable one it is the euthanasia of the will in hope of this the brahman is ordered after he has passed the best years of his life to forsake possessions and family and lead the life of a hermit but if conversely the desire outlives the capacity for enjoyment and we now regret particular pleasures in life which we miss instead of seeing the emptiness and vanity of all 
and if then gold the abstract representative of the objects of desire for which the sense is dead takes the place of all these objects themselves and now excites the same vehement passions which were formerly more pardonably awakened by the objects of actual pleasure and thus now with deadened senses a lifeless but indestructible object is desired with equally indestructible eagerness or also if in the same way existence in the opinion of others takes the place of existence and action in the real world and now kindles the same passions then the will has become sublimated and etherealized into avarice or ambition but has thereby thrown itself into the last fortress in which it can only now be besieged by death the end of existence has been missed all these considerations afford us a fuller explanation of that purification conversion of the will and deliverance denoted in the preceding chapter by the expression deuteras plus which is brought about by the suffering of life and without doubt is the most frequent for it is the way of sinners such as we all are the other way which leads to the same goal by means of mere knowledge and the consequent appropriation of the suffering of a whole world is the narrow path of the elect the saints and therefore to be regarded as a rare exception therefore without that first way for most of us there would be no salvation to hope for however we struggle against entering upon it and strive rather to procure for ourselves a safe and agreeable existence whereby we chain our will ever more firmly to life the conduct of the ascetics is the opposite of this they make their life intentionally as poor hard and empty of pleasure as possible because they have their true and ultimate welfare in view but fate and the course of things care for us better than we ourselves for they frustrate on all sides our arrangements for an utopian life the folly of which is evident enough from its brevity uncertainty and emptiness and its conclusion by bitter death they strew thorns upon thorns in our path and meet us everywhere with healing sorrow the panacea of our misery what really gives its wonderful and ambiguous character to our life is this that two diametrically opposite aims constantly cross each other in it that of the individual will directed to chimerical happiness in an ephemeral dreamlike and delusive existence in which with reference to the past happiness and unhappiness are a matter of indifference and the present is every moment becoming the past and that of fate visibly enough directed to the destruction of our happiness and thereby to the mortification of our will and the abolition of the illusion that holds us chained in the bonds of this world the prevalent and peculiarly protestant view that the end of life lies solely and immediately in the moral virtues thus in the practice of justice and benevolence betrays its insufficiency even in the fact that so miserably little real and pure morality is found among men i am not speaking at all of lofty virtue nobleness magnanimity and self-sacrifice which one hardly finds anywhere but in plays and novels but only of those virtues which are the duty of every one let whoever is old think of all those with whom he has had to do how many persons will he have met who were merely really and truly honest were not by far the greater number in spite of their shameless indignation at the slightest suspicion of dishonesty or even untruthfulness in plain words the precise opposite were not abject selfishness boundless avarice well-concealed knavery and also poisonous envy and fiendish delight in the misfortunes of others so universally prevalent that the slightest exception was met with surprise and benevolence how very rarely it extends beyond a gift of what is so superfluous that one never misses it and is the whole end of existence to lie in such exceedingly rare and weak traces of morality if we place it on the contrary in the entire reversal of this nature of ours which bears the evil fruits just mentioned brought about by suffering the matter gains an appearance of probability and is brought into agreement with what actually lies before us life presents itself then as a purifying process of which the purifying lie is pain if the process is carried out it leaves behind it the previous immorality and wickedness as refuse and there appears what the veda says finditur nodus cordis dissolvuntur omnes dubitationes 
eusque opera evanescunt as agreeing with this view the fifteenth sermon of meister eckhart will be found very well worth reading end of chapter forty nine recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifty of supplements to the fourth book from the world as will and idea volume three by arthur schopenhauer translated by r b haldane and j kemp this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifty epiphilosophy at the conclusion of my exposition a few reflections concerning my philosophy itself may find their place my philosophy does not pretend to explain the existence of the world in its ultimate grounds it rather sticks to the facts of external and internal experience as they are accessible to every one and shows the true and deepest connection of them without really going beyond them to any extra mundane things and their relations to the world it therefore arrives at no conclusions as to what lies beyond all possible experience but affords merely an exposition of what is given in the external world and in self-consciousness thus contents itself with comprehending the nature of the world in its inner connection with itself it is consequently immanent in the kantian sense of the word but just on this account it leaves many questions untouched for example why what is proved as a fact is as it is and not otherwise etc all such questions however or rather the answers to them are really transcendent that is they cannot be thought by the forms and functions of our intellect do not enter into these it is therefore related to them as our sensibility is related to the possible properties of bodies for which we have no senses after all my explanations one may still ask for example whence has sprung this will that is free to assert itself the manifestation of which is the world or to deny itself the manifestation of which we do not know what is the fatality lying beyond all experience which has placed it in the very doubtful dilemma of either appearing as a world in which suffering and death reign or else denying its very being or again what can have prevailed upon it to forsake the infinitely preferable peace of blessed nothingness an individual will one may add can only turn to its own destruction through error in the choice thus through the fault of knowledge but the will in itself before all manifestation consequently still without knowledge how could it go astray and fall into the ruin of its present condition whence in general is the great discord that permeates this world it may further be asked how deep into the true being of the world the roots of individuality go to which it may certainly be answered they go as deep as the assertion of the will to live where the denial of the will appears they cease for they have arisen with the assertion but one might indeed even put the question what would i be if i were not will to live and more of the same kind to all such questions we would first have to reply that the expression of the most universal and general form of our intellect is the principle of sufficient reason but that just on this account that principle finds application only to the phenomenon not to the being in itself of things yet all whence and why depend upon that principle alone as a result of the kantian philosophy it is no longer an aeterna veritas but merely the form that is the function of our intellect which is essentially cerebral and originally a mere tool in the service of the will which it therefore presupposes together with all its objectifications but our whole knowing and conceiving is bound to its forms accordingly we must conceive everything in time consequently as a before and after then as cause and effect and also as above and below whole and part etc and cannot by any means escape from this sphere in which all possibility of our knowledge lies now these forms are utterly unsuited to the problems raised here nor are they fit or able to comprehend their solution even if it were given therefore with our intellect this mere tool of the will we are everywhere striking upon insoluble problems 
as against the walls of our prison but besides this it may at least be assumed as probable that not only for us is knowledge of all that has been asked about impossible but no such knowledge is possible in general thus never and in no way that these relations are not only relatively but absolutely insusceptible of investigation that not only does no one know them but that they are in themselves unknowable because they do not enter into the form of knowledge in general this corresponds to what scotus erigena says de mirabili divina ignorantia quad deus non intelligit quid ipse sit book two for knowableness in general with its most essential and therefore constantly necessary form of subject and object belongs merely to the phenomenal appearance not to the being in itself of things where knowledge and consequently idea is there is also only phenomenon and we stand there already in the province of the phenomenal nay knowledge in general is known to us only as a phenomenon of brain and we are not only unjustified in conceiving it otherwise but also incapable of doing so what the world is as world may be understood it is phenomenal manifestation and we can know that which manifests itself in it directly from ourselves by means of a thorough analysis of self-consciousness then however by means of this key to the nature of the world the whole phenomenal manifestation can be deciphered as i believe i have succeeded in doing but if we leave the world in order to answer the questions indicated above we have also left the whole sphere in which not only connection according to reason and consequence but even knowledge itself is possible then all is instabilis telus inabilis unda the nature of things before or beyond the world and consequently beyond the will is open to no investigation because knowledge in general is itself only a phenomenon and therefore exists only in the world as the world exists only in it the inner being in itself of things is nothing that knows no intellect but an unconscious knowledge is only added as an accident a means of assistance to the phenomenon of that inner being and can therefore apprehend that being itself only in proportion to its own nature which is designed with reference to quite different ends those of the individual will consequently very imperfectly here lies the reason why a perfect understanding of the existence nature and origin of the world extending to its ultimate ground and satisfying all demands is impossible so much as to the limits of my philosophy and indeed of all philosophy the enkaipan that is that the inner nature in all things is absolutely one and the same my age had already grasped and understood after the eleatic scotus erigena giordano bruno and spinoza had thoroughly taught and schelling had revived this doctrine but what this one is and how it is able to exhibit itself as the many is the problem the solution of which is first found in my philosophy certainly from the most ancient times man had been called the microcosm i have reversed the proposition and shown the world as the macranthropos because will and idea exhaust its nature as they do that of man but it is clearly more correct to learn to understand the world from man than man from the world for one has to explain what is indirectly given thus external perception from what is directly given thus self-consciousness not conversely with the pantheists then i have certainly that enkaipan in common but not the pantheos because i do not go beyond experience taken in its widest sense and still less do i put myself in contradiction with the data which lie before me scotus erigena quite consistently with the spirit of pantheism explains every phenomenon as a theophany but then this conception must also be applied to the most terrible and abominable phenomena fine theophanies what further distinguishes me from pantheism is principally the following one that their theos is an x an unknown quantity the will on the other hand is of all possible things the one that is known to us most exactly the only thing given immediately and therefore exclusively fitted for the explanation of the rest 
for what is unknown must always be explained by what is better known not conversely two that their theos manifests itself animi causa to unfold his glory or indeed to let himself be admired apart from the vanity here attributed to him they are placed in the position of being obliged to sophisticate away the colossal evil of the world but the world remains in glaring and terrible contradiction with that imagined excellence with me on the contrary the will arrives through its objectification however this may occur at self-knowledge whereby its abolition conversion salvation becomes possible and accordingly with me alone ethics has a sure foundation and is completely worked out in agreement with the sublime and profound religions brahmanism buddhism and christianity not merely with judaism and mohammedanism the metaphysic of the beautiful also is first fully cleared up as a result of my fundamental truth and no longer requires to take refuge behind empty words with me alone is the evil of the world honestly confessed in its whole magnitude this is rendered possible by the fact that the answer to the question as to its origin coincides with the answer to the question as to the origin of the world on the other hand in all other systems since they are all optimistic the question as to the origin of evil is the incurable disease ever breaking out anew with which they are affected and in consequence of which they struggle along with palliatives and quack remedies three that i start from experience and the natural self-consciousness given to every one and lead to the will as that which alone is metaphysical thus i adopt the ascending analytical method the pantheists again adopt the opposite method the descending or synthetical they start from their theos which they beg or take by force although sometimes under the name substantia or absolute and this unknown is then supposed to explain everything that is better known four that with me the world does not fill the whole possibility of all being but in this there still remains much room for that which we denote only negatively as the denial of the will to live pantheism on the other hand is essentially optimism but if the world is what is best then the matter may rest there five that to the pantheists the perceptible world thus the world of idea is just the intentional manifestation of the god indwelling in it which contains no real explanation of its appearance but rather requires to be explained itself with me on the other hand the world as idea appears merely per accidens because the intellect with its external perception is primarily only the medium of motives for the more perfect phenomena of will which gradually rises to that objectivity of perceptibility in which the world exists in this sense its origin as an object of perception is really accounted for and not as with the pantheists by means of untenable fictions since in consequence of the kantian criticism of all speculative theology the philosophizers of germany almost all threw themselves back upon spinoza so that the whole series of futile attempts known by the name of the post-kantian philosophy are simply spinozism tastelessly dressed up veiled in all kinds of unintelligible language and otherwise distorted i wish now that i have explained the relation of my philosophy to pantheism in general to point out its relation to spinozism in particular it stands then to spinozism as the new testament stands to the old what the old testament has in common with the new is the same god creator analogous to this the world exists with me as with spinoza by its inner power and through itself but with spinoza his substantia aeterna the inner nature of the world which he himself calls god is also as regards its moral character and worth jehovah the god creator who applauds his own creation and finds that all is very good pantakala leon spinoza has deprived him of nothing but personality thus according to him also the world and all in it is wholly excellent and as it ought to be therefore man has nothing more to do than vivere agere sum esse conservare ex fundamento proprium utile querendi ethics four sixty seven 
he is even to rejoice in his life as long as it lasts entirely in accordance with ecclesiastes nine seven through ten in short it is optimism therefore its ethical side is weak as in the old testament nay it is even false and in part revolting with me on the other hand the will or the inner nature of the world is by no means jehovah it is rather as it were the crucified saviour or the crucified thief according as it resolves therefore my ethical teaching agrees with that of christianity completely and in its highest tendencies and not less with that of brahmanism and buddhism spinoza could not get rid of the jews quos semel est imbuta recen servabit odorem his contempt for the brutes which as mere things for our use he also declares to be without rights is thoroughly jewish and in union with pantheism is at the same time absurd and detestable with all this spinoza remains a very great man but in order to estimate his work correctly we must keep in view his relation to descartes the latter had sharply divided nature into mind and matter that is thinking and extended substance and had also placed god and the world in complete opposition to each other spinoza also so long as he was a cartesian taught all that in his cogitatis metaphysicis chapter twelve one one sixteen sixty five only in his later years did he see the fundamental falseness of that double dualism and accordingly his own philosophy principally consists of the indirect abolition of these two antitheses yet partly to avoid injuring his teacher partly in order to be less offensive he gave it a positive appearance by means of a strictly dogmatic form although its content is chiefly negative his identification of the world with god has also this negative significance alone for to call the world god is not to explain it it remains a riddle under the one name as under the other but these two negative truths had value for their age as for every age in which there still are conscious or unconscious cartesians he makes the mistake common to all philosophers before locke of starting from conceptions without having previously investigated their origin such for example as substance cause etc and in such a method of procedure these conceptions then receive a much too extensive validity those who in the most recent times refused to acknowledge the neo-spinozism which had appeared for example jacobi were principally deterred from doing so by the bugbear of fatalism by this is to be understood every doctrine which refers the existence of the world together with the critical position of mankind in it to any absolute necessity that is to a necessity that cannot be further explained those who feared fatalism again believed that all that was of importance was to deduce the world from the free act of will of a being existing outside it as if it were antecedently certain which of the two was more correct or even better merely in relation to us what is however especially assumed here is the non dator tertium and accordingly hitherto every philosophy has represented one or the other i am the first to depart from this for i have actually established the tertium the act of will from which the world arises is our own it is free for the principle of sufficient reason from which alone all necessity derives its significance is merely the form of its phenomenon just on this account this phenomenon if it once exists is absolutely necessary in its course in consequence of this alone we can recognize in it the nature of the act of will and accordingly eventualiter will otherwise end of chapter fifty recording by expatriate in bangor maine appendix to supplements to the fourth book from the world as will and idea volume three by arthur schopenhauer translated by r b haldane and j kemp this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine appendix abstract of schopenhauer's essay on the fourfold root of the principle of sufficient reason fourth edition edited by frauenstedt the first edition appeared in eighteen thirteen this essay is divided into eight chapters 
the first is introductory the second contains an historical review of previous philosophical doctrines on the subject the third deals with the insufficiency of the previous treatment of the principle and prescribes the lines of the new departure the fourth fifth sixth and seventh treat of the four classes of objects for the subject and the forms of the principle of sufficient reason which respectively characterize these classes the eighth contains general remarks and results it will be convenient to summarize these chapters severally chapter one schopenhauer points out that plato and kant agree in recommending as the method of all knowledge obedience to two laws that of homogeneity and that of specification the former bids us by attention to the points of resemblance and agreement in things get at their kinds and combine them into species and these species again into genera until we have arrived at the highest concept of all that which embraces everything this law being transcendental or an essential in our faculty of reason assumes that nature is in harmony with it an assumption which is expressed in the old rule entia praeter necessitatem non esse multiplicanda the law of specification on the other hand is stated by kant in these words entium varietates non temere esse minuendas that is to say we must carefully distinguish the species which are united under a genus and the lower kinds which in their turn are united under these species taking care not to make a leap and subsume the lower kinds and individuals under the concept of the genus since this is always capable of division but never descends to the object of pure perception plato and kant agree that these laws are transcendental and that they presuppose that things are in harmony with them the previous treatment of the principle of sufficient reason even by kant has been a failure owing to the neglect of the second of these laws it may well be that we shall find that this principle is the common expression of more than one fundamental principle of knowledge and that the necessity to which it refers is therefore of different kinds it may be stated in these words nihil est sine ratione cur potius sit quam non sit this is a general expression for the different forms of the assumption which everywhere justifies that question why which is the mother of all science chapter two schopenhauer in this chapter traces historically the forms in which the principle had been stated by his predecessors and their influence he points out that in greek philosophy it appeared in two aspects that of the necessity of a ground for a logical judgment and that of a cause for every physical change and that these two aspects were systematically confounded the aristotelian division not of the forms of the principle itself but of one of its aspects the causal exemplified a confusion which continued throughout the scholastic period descartes succeeds no better his proof of the existence of god that the immensity of his nature is a cause or reason beyond which no cause is needed for his existence simply illustrates the gross confusion between cause and ground of knowledge which underlies every form of this ontological proof that a miserable fellow like hegel whose entire philosophy is nothing but a monstrous amplification of the ontological proof should dare to defend this proof against kant's criticism of it is an alliance of which the ontological proof itself little as it knows of shame might well feel ashamed it is not to be expected i should speak respectfully of people who have brought philosophy into disrespect spinoza made the same confusion when he laid it down that the cause of existence was either contained in the nature and definition of the thing as it existed or was to be found outside that thing it was through this confusion of the ground of knowledge with the efficient cause that he succeeded in identifying god with the world the true picture of spinoza's causa sui is baron munchausen encircling his horse with his legs and raising himself and the horse upwards by means of his pigtail with the inscription causa sui written below leibniz was the first to place the principle of sufficient reason in the position of a first principle and to indicate the difference between its two meanings but it was wolf 
who first completely distinguished them and divided the doctrine into three kinds principium fiendi cause principium ascendi possibility and principium cognoscendi baumgarten reimarus lambert and platner added nothing to the work of wolf and the next great step was hume's question as to the validity of the principle kant's distinction of the logical or formal principle of knowledge every proposition must have its ground from the transcendental or material principle every thing must have its ground was followed out by his immediate successors but when we come to schelling we find the proposition that gravitation is the reason and light the cause of things a proposition which is quoted simply as a curiosity for such a piece of nonsense deserves no place among the opinions of earnest and honest inquirers the chapter concludes by pointing out the futility of the attempts to prove the principle every proof is the exhibition of the ground of a judgment which has been expressed and of which just because that ground is exhibited we predicate truth the principle of sufficient reason is just this expression of the demand for such a ground and he who seeks a proof that is the exhibition of a ground for this principle itself presupposes it as true and so falls into the circle of seeking a proof of the justification of the demand for proof chapter three in the third chapter schopenhauer points out that the two applications of the principle of sufficient reason distinguished by his predecessors to judgments which must have a ground and to the changes of real objects which must have a cause are not exhaustive the reason why the three sides of a certain triangle are equal is that the angles are equal and this is neither a logical deduction nor a case of causation with a view to stating exhaustively the various kinds into which the application of the principle falls it is necessary to determine the nature of the principle itself all our ideas are objects of the subject and all objects of the subject are our ideas but our ideas stand to one another as a matter of fact in an orderly connection which is always determinable a priori in point of form and on account of which nothing that is in itself separate and wholly independent of other things can be the object of our consciousness it is this connection which the principle of sufficient reason in its generality expresses the relations which constitute it are what schopenhauer calls its root and they fall into four classes which are discussed in the four following chapters chapter four in the fourth chapter schopenhauer deals with the first class of objects for the subject and the form of the principle of sufficient reason which obtains in it this first class is that of those complete ideas of perception which form part of our experience and which are referable to some sensation of our bodies these ideas are capable of being perceived only under the forms of space and time if time were the only form there would be no coexistence and therefore no persistence if space were their only form there would be no succession and therefore no change time may therefore be defined as the possibility of mutually exclusive conditions of the same thing but the union of these two forms of existence is the essential condition of reality and this union is the work of the understanding see world as will and idea volume one section four and the table of predicables annexed to volume two chapter four in this class of objects for the subject the principle of sufficient reason appears as the law of causality or the principle of sufficient reason of becoming and it is through it that all objects which present themselves in perception are bound together through the changes of their states when a new state of one or more objects makes its appearance it must have been preceded by another on which it regularly follows this is causal sequence and the first state is the cause the second the effect the law has thus to do exclusively with the changes of objects of external experience and not with things themselves a circumstance which is fatal to the validity of the cosmological proof of the existence of god it follows also from the essential connection of causality with succession that the notion of reciprocity with its contemporaneous existence of cause and effect is a delusion the chain of causes and effects does not affect either matter which is that in which all changes take place 
or the original forces of nature through which causation becomes possible and which exist apart from all change and in this sense out of time but which yet are everywhere present for example chemical forces see above volume one section twenty six in nature causation assumes three different forms that of cause in the narrow sense of stimulus and of motive on which differences depend the true distinctions between inorganic bodies plants and animals it is only of cause properly so called that newton's third law of the equality of action and reaction is true and only here do we find the degree of the effect proportionate to that of the cause the absence of this feature characterizes stimulation motive demands knowledge as its condition and intelligence is therefore the true characteristic of the animal the three forms are in principle identical the difference being due to the degrees of receptivity in existence what is called freedom of the will is therefore an absurdity as is also kant's practical reason these results are followed by an examination of the nature of vision which schopenhauer sums up in these words i have examined all these visual processes in detail in order to show that the understanding is active in all of them the understanding which by apprehending every change as an effect and referring it to its cause creates on the basis of the a priori and fundamental intuitions or perceptions of space and time the objective world that phenomenon of the brain for which the sensations of the senses afford only certain data and this task the understanding accomplishes only through its proper form the law of causality and accomplishes it directly without the aid of reflection that is of abstract knowledge through concepts and words which are the material of secondary knowledge of thought thus of the reason what understanding knows aright is reality what reason knows aright is truth that is a judgment which has a ground the opposite of the former being illusion what is falsely perceived of the latter error what is falsely thought all understanding is an immediate apprehension of the causal relation and this is the sole function of understanding and not the complicated working of the twelve kantian categories the theory of which is a mistaken one a consequence of this conclusion is that arithmetical processes do not belong to the understanding concerned as they are with abstract conceptions but it must not be forgotten that between volition and the apparently consequential action of the body there is no causal relation for they are the same thing perceived in two different ways section twenty three contains a detailed refutation of kant's proof of the a priori nature of the causal relation in the second analogy of experience of the critique of pure reason the gist of the objection being that the so-called subjective succession is as much objective in reality as what is called objective by kant phenomena may well follow one another without following from one another chapter five the fifth chapter commences with an examination of the distinction between man and the brutes man possesses reason that is to say he has a class of ideas of which the brutes are not capable abstract ideas as distinguished from those ideas of perception from which the former kind are yet derived the consequence is that the brute neither speaks nor laughs and lacks all those qualities which make human life great the nature of motives too is different where abstract ideas are possible no doubt the actions of men follow of necessity from their causes not less than is the case with the brutes but the kind of sequence through thought which renders choice that is the conscious conflict of motives possible is different our abstract thoughts being incapable of being objects of perception would be outside consciousness and the operations of thought would be impossible were it not that they are fixed for sense by arbitrary signs called words which therefore always indicate general conceptions it is just because the brutes are incapable of general conceptions that they have no faculty of speech the thought does not consist in the mere presence of abstract ideas in consciousness but in the union and separation of two or more of them subject to the manifold restrictions and modifications which logic deals with such a clearly expressed conceptual relation is a judgment 
in relation to judgments the principle of sufficient reason is valid in a new form that of the ground of knowing in this form it asserts that if a judgment is to express knowledge it must have a ground and it is just because it has a ground that it has ascribed to it the predicate true the grounds on which a judgment may depend are divisible into four kinds a judgment may have another judgment as its ground in which case its truth is formal or logical there is no truth except in the relation of a judgment to something outside it and intrinsic truth which is sometimes distinguished from extrinsic logical truth is therefore an absurdity a judgment may also have its ground in sense perception and its truth is then material truth again those forms of knowledge which lie in the understanding and in pure sensibility as the conditions of the possibility of experience may be the ground of a judgment which is then synthetical a priori finally those formal conditions of all thinking which lie in the reason may be the ground of a judgment which may in that case be called metalogically true of these metalogical judgments there are four and they were long ago discovered and called laws of thought one a subject is equal to the sum of its predicates two a subject cannot at once have a given predicate affirmed and denied of it three of two contradictorily opposed predicates one must belong to every subject four truth is the relation of a judgment to something outside it as its sufficient reason reason it may be remarked has no material but only formal truth chapter six the third class of objects for the subject is constituted by the formal element in perception the forms of outer and inner sense space and time this class of ideas in which time and space appear as pure intuitions is distinguished from that other class in which they are objects of perception by the presence of matter which has been shown to be the perceptibility of time and space in one aspect and causality which has become objective in another space and time have this property that all their parts stand to one another in a relation in which each is determined and conditioned by another this relation is peculiar and is intelligible to us neither through understanding nor through reason but solely through pure intuition or perception a priori and the law according to which the parts of space and time thus determine one another is called the law of sufficient reason of being in space every position is determined with reference to every other position so that the first stands to the second in the relation of a consequence to its ground in time every moment is conditioned by that which precedes it the ground of being in the form of the law of sequence is here very simple owing to the circumstance that time has only one dimension on the nexus of the position of the parts of space depends the entire science of geometry ground of knowledge produces conviction only as distinguished from insight into the ground of being thus it is that the attempt which even euclid at times makes to produce conviction as distinguished from insight into the ground of being in geometry is a mistake and induces aversions to mathematics in many an admirable mind chapter seven the remaining class of objects for the subject is a very peculiar and important one it comprehends only one object the immediate object of inner sense the subject in volition which becomes an object of knowledge but only in inner sense and therefore always in time and never in space and in time only under limitations there can be no knowledge of knowledge for that would imply that the subject had separated itself from knowledge and yet knew knowledge which is impossible the subject is the condition of the existence of ideas and can never itself become idea or object it knows itself therefore never as knowing but only as willing thus what we know in ourselves is never what knows but what wills the will the identity of the subject of volition with the subject of knowledge through which the word i includes both is the insoluble problem the identity of the knowing with the known is inexplicable and yet is immediately present the operation of a motive is not like that of all other causes known only from without and therefore indirectly but also from within motivation is in fact causality viewed from within chapter eight 
in this the concluding chapter schopenhauer sums up his results necessity has no meaning other than that of the irresistible sequence of the effect where the cause is given all necessity is thus conditioned an absolute or unconditioned necessity is a contradiction in terms and there is a fourfold necessity corresponding to the four forms of the principle of sufficient reason one the logical form according to the principle of the ground of knowledge on account of which if the premises are given the conclusion follows two the physical form according to the law of causality on account of which if the cause is given the effect must follow three the mathematical form according to the law of being on account of which every relation expressed by a true geometrical proposition is what it is affirmed to be and every correct calculation is irrefutable four the moral form on account of which every human being and every brute must when the motive appears perform the only act which accords with the inborn and unalterable character a consequence of this is that every department of science has one or other of the forms of the principle of sufficient reason as its basis in conclusion schopenhauer points out that just because the principle of sufficient reason belongs to the a priori element in intelligence it cannot be applied to the entirety of things to the universe as inclusive of intelligence such a universe is mere phenomenon and what is only true because it belongs to the form of intelligence can have no application to intelligence itself thus it is that it cannot be said that the universe and all things in it exist because of something else in other words the cosmological proof of the existence of god is inadmissible end of appendix recording by expatriate in bangor maine end of the world as will and idea volume three by arthur schopenhauer translated by r b haldane and j kemp